And we are live. This is Dark Journalist. Uh, what a fantastic crowd we have out there already in the ideas room. And of course, I'm joined by the lovely Olivia. Hi, everybody. And uh, Olivia, before we get started with this epic tonight, <laughs> uh, Stepford Biden came out for a press conference and stumbled around. So his own party even hates him now. I know. Poor old Joe. It, huh? it was so cringy. It's too much. It's, he's done. He's done. We know it. It's interesting. It's interesting uh, where they're planning to go with this, as well as a lot of those mandates are collapsing, just as we see Joe collapsing. Uh, they seem to be revving up for war with Russia. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Russia's talking about putting missiles in Cuba. Oh, I didn't know that. Direct in the hot zone. So here we are. It's 1962, October, 13 days. It's kicking off. Uh, and there are strange things going on in the hot zone. Flash forward some 60 years later, and here we are again. Um, but it is unusual. I'd have to say that uh, the level, you know, we haven't been at a point like this with Russia since that era. I mean, um, you'd have to look maybe in the Reagan era. There's a lot of stress around nuclear weapons. But basically, uh, the Biden administration came in with this, you know, let's have tension with the Russians. And the Russians, uh, for some reason now, we haven't had good relations with them since good old George W. Bush. Uh, well, Bush was so busy bombing the bejesus out of Iraq that uh, he didn't couldn't really take on Russia. But as soon as Obama got in there, sour relations. Hillary, Secretary of State, sour relations. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, right at the end of that administration of Obama's, they were saying, hey, you know what? We really are going to get back at you at a time of our choosing. Remember all that talk? And Biden was right on top of that too. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting to me when Trump got in, they wanted to do the whole, oh, it's Russia collusion. So they do not want these powers getting together. They like keeping them apart at that highest possible level. Uh, how does that relate to what we're getting into tonight? That's gonna be an interesting question as we go forward. And we're gonna have to operate with that wide angle lens that we're so used to on the X-Series. This is X-Series 118. It is Ghislaine Maxwell, Atlantis the Craze in the Hot Zone. Um, now, if you are a familiar viewer of this program, you will know that X-Series 100 was an episode about Ghislaine and her ties through her company, uh, the nonprofit uh, Let's Save the Oceans company, Terramar, to the search for the lost continent of Atlantis somewhere in the Bahamas. Um, so we're going to need our hot zone information. We're going to need our deep state information, and we're going to need something else. We're going to need some way to correlate the mysterious geopolitical happenings going on there in the hot zone with all the mysterious information we're going to be bringing forward tonight in relation to Ghislaine, her dad, her husband and her friends and the incredible quest around the Atlantis cult, which is such a core part that is so widely missed uh, in relation. And I understand why it's missed. It's been obscured heavily um, in, relation to, uh, in relation to this whole elite movement. Now, I do want to say this, which is um, over and over again, we've seen these exposés on Epstein and Maxwell. Uh, both on the mainstream side and on the independent side. On the independent side, they've actually gotten a, a lot of it right. And uh, that's where I think most of the important information is. The mainstream has covered it in a kind of Me Too fashion, which actually dumbs down the nature of it. You know, this is going back to like casting couch in Hollywood type thinking about it, which is a certain type of thing to expose. But what we're getting into with people like Epstein and Maxwell is a much deeper level. First of all, very, very deep levels in the deep state, uh, occult levels. How about ancient technology levels? How about advanced technology levels? How about uh, an entirely different form of physics? And then eugenics. That's a little bit different than me too. So uh, that's something that the alternative side has really got right. And I will say this for people who've done those types of uh, research on the independent side, they've gone really far. And uh, so this stuff, this angle that we're coming in on is, is coming in different 
from a different side of it all. Um, and it's, you know, with a nod to all the things that people have produced in relation to Maxwell and Epstein and all the things they were doing there in relation to trafficking. And there's some hint around the occult aspect of this. But when we go into it, we're going to show you that um, so much of this occultism relates to the ancient Atlantis uh, battle and the battle over that information and the technology and the wisdom about that particular era and how these mystery schools and secret society have that as a sort of a fundamental core. And if we don't understand that, we're not going to understand Maxwell. We're not going to understand her trial. We're not going to understand her family. And we're not going to understand uh, all of the strange mythology and imagery around Epstein Island. So we're going to get into that tonight. It's great to have so many of you with us. And before we get started in earnest, Miss Olivia, what do you got? Um, I think we just have to acknowledge Meatloaf passed away. Oh, yes. <laughs> you know, no, he was the great. wonderful Meatloaf. <laughs> he is so beloved. He was fantastic. Um, and, you know, he was one of those guys who really did it his way. He made it at a very young age, and uh, he just had an incredible voice. And Actually, there's a fantastic uh, made-for-TV biopic about him that I loved. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. Okay. You know, where he, um, about his childhood, his, his abusive childhood, and how he lost his voice and then got it back again. It's, you know. Fascinating. It's great. Yeah, he was an interesting guy, and he's cast against type as a rock star with his big physique and everything else. And he made it all work, and he sounded great. Um, there are a lot of uh, deaths happening in short order here mm -hmm. in the last week or two, and um, it is uh, quite remarkable. And you know, but certainly in the music realm, when we get there, it's always tough. You know, when we lose people on that side, because you always wonder what else they might have done. Uh, and you know, we reflected recently on the 75th birthday of David Bowie. And uh, it's been five years since we wow. lost. But no, it's six, actually, because oh it's God. 2016. Think about that. So um, just incredible. And then you think, what else, you know, what else would they have done? Mm -hmm. But, uh, of course, they've left behind so many incredible avenues for us to pursue. So uh, that is remarkable. And um, I will say this, that there seems something very epic about 2022 in general. So I expect... The landscape is going to change rather dramatically. Is Atlantis Rising part of that landscape? Well, what do you mean Atlantis Rising? <laughs> I mean, an actual landmass rising off the east coast of America. That's something which the mystery schools brought forward and gave us through uh, the work of Edgar Cayce, Rudolf Steiner, and Theosophy that there were going to be earth changes and as lands went down in certain areas other lands were going to come up one of the most um interesting and the real kind of focal point of that type of research has to do with the island of bimini and what uh, the psychic edgar casey put forward in relation to bimini and how this ties in with uh, maxwell and all the things going on in relation to Terramar and the Atlantis cult around Maxwell and Epstein is going to be very, very uh, important. So we're going to start and move through. Now, if you're familiar with some of the Hot Zone episodes, you have some of this background. I'm going to give, lay it out, and then we're going to go into how this all connects up. Uh, in the second half of the program, I want to remind everyone that we're going to be taking your questions. So you can ask those now, and Miss Olivia is going to be putting them together for us in the second part. Let's see if I can get through all this. Mm -hmm. This is probably two episodes, frankly. <laughs> that is the usual case. You usually print out too much, and there's not enough time, even with three hours. Mm, you know what it is? It's, uh, it's the research in relation to it. There's too many things you couldn't leave out. You can edit out only so much. Um, but I think in relation to this, uh, it's going to be an ongoing piece because uh, if we look to the work of someone like Egerton Sykes, for example, who we've cited on this program, and he's long forgotten now, but he was actually the most articulate expert around Atlantis, in my opinion. Sykes was an ex-British intelligence officer who claimed that there were ruins somewhere in the Atlantic uh, and then later saying that they were in the Bahamas, that belonged to the ancient Egyptians. 
which you know would be kind of a problem for the historical record. And he said that there was a large scale geopolitical fight over those ruins. I always thought that was strange. Later uh, in my discussions with people and doing the show, I started to get communications from people telling me about an area that was between Bimini and Cuba and the Yucatan. And this area uh, is something that people who work in that area understand as the hot zone, or they have some title of it that relates to that. Hot zone is kind of the catch-all catchphrase that we brought forward on this program. And the hot zone is an area that stretches between Bimini, uh, the island of Bimini off the coast of Florida, and the western tip of Cuba, where Thomas Townsend Brown spent so much time, remember? And also uh, the Yucatan Peninsula, and then there through the Gulf Stream. So we have kind of a wide area that overlaps into the Bermuda Triangle, which might explain a few things. The thing about the hot zone is if you work there, according to some of the people who've come forward to me about it, um, you have to sign various types of NDAs in order to be down there working. Because if you see a pyramid as you're going by mapping the ocean floor, you can't come up the next day and tell your friends or the media. Uh, if you're in the military and you see that, it's a court-martial offense. So there's something about the ruins that are down there that this is a very sensitive, delicate secret. And if you are uh, working in that capacity and you see those, you can't talk about it. Well, I've known for years about everything from the Bimini Road to the Casey predictions about land rising off Bimini. And I've researched for years about... Um, what's happened in relation to Cuba. And part of this story, I think, that's left out in relation to Cuba is something about uh, these ruins that were found off Cuba in 2001. And this is all a very interesting piece of this, which involves uh, an oceanographic engineer named Paulina Zalitsky, who was um, brought to Cuba by the KGB, or she had a KGB uh, watcher. And um, you know, she was really under the Soviet system and had lived on Cuba for a number of years. And then she defected to Canada and got away from her KGB handler who was abusive and all the rest and all the manipulations that the government were trying to get her to do. And she went to Canada and started an undersea exploration company with her husband. Well, interestingly enough, years later, Castro became aware of that company and he said, will you come back? Because I need to find out all about these, watch the code, Spanish galleons. Now, whenever you get around the hot zone, when you start hearing about Spanish galleons, especially through official channels, forget it. They're talking about ancient ruins. And um, of course, you know, the treasures and the things like that, fine. You know, there's a whole treasure trove cottage industry about that. However, uh, it's also become a gigantic cover for these very unusual ancient ruins in advanced uh, culture left behind. This is a big problem for a number of reasons because if they find an advanced culture underwater, they're gonna to have to explain it because that area uh, hasn't been, you know, sort of habitable in 12 to 50,000 years. So you're gonna to have to draw that whole human story back further. Well, one of the things that the mystery schools did, um, like anthroposophy and the Casey work and theosophy, is they, they try to start to bring this to our consciousness in the late 19th century through the 20th century and into the present. Uh, and the idea was there was a culture back there that was just as advanced as we are and that they got into a lot of spiritual, technological trouble and, in essence, blew themselves up and almost took the entire world with them. Um, and that we were moving into a period, coming into this period, where we were going to have an opportunity to either sort of reenact this disaster or learn from the past and remember, have a kind of cultural memory, even though it's been wiped out so many documents. Now, uh, Atlantis fundamentally, through the work of great figures uh, like Graham Hancock and others, has been given a basis on which people can understand it. And um, it goes all the way back, of course, to Plato citing it and Plato talking about this ancient culture that was from 9500 uh, BC. And that that whole period was when the Atlanteans came into Greece and the 
Cretans fought them off. Well, what we see in that whole story is that they have a strange uh, technological ability. They're huge. They're outside the gates of Hercules. That means they're in the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, they angered the gods, and they disappeared in a night and a day, as it goes. Well, certain types of disasters would make you disappear pretty quickly. Uh, and so when we get into the story, we're going to have to look at those sources. Plato had said the story came from a priest in Egypt, and that they had kept the story of Atlantis in Egypt. There are other sources as well, but Plato's was the most fundamental on record. And so the people who were pursuing a very kind of podunk Egyptology version based a lot on, you know, really kind of archaic 18th century techniques for going through the Egyptian records. They couldn't fathom to themselves that this thing of civilization went back 50, 60, maybe 100,000, 200,000 years. They were stuck in this Sumerian as the earliest culture. Everything came around 4,000 BC. There was some stuff before that. And the religious patterns followed something very similar. In science, uh, in archaeology, archaeology had a lot to catch up with because once they had established the history, nobody wanted to change it. And this is how we got into this whole quagmire and how we have kind of lost the essence of the Egyptian culture being a legacy from a much more advanced culture. This is what the mystery schools decided at a certain point. We can't leave things in this state. So we need to open up about this and get it out to the culture. There were people inside those groups in the mystery schools that didn't want to go on the record about this. They didn't want that out there because that was one of the secrets that they had kept. And the decision was had that the way humanity was headed, um, it was not going to be recognizable soon. So they better do something. And so a lot of this stuff came out. And uh, we have a lot of groups in the early 1900s, like the Nazis, for example, but other groups too, picking up on this information and really taking it in a totally uh, bad direction. That doesn't change the nature of it. It just means some group you know, ran away with some things that were talked about in theosophy and decided, hey, that makes us superior. <laughs> um, but that, that was not the way it was laid out um, by the work of the mystery schools. Now, um, I found the most telling sort of uh, comprehensive version of the Atlantis story in the Edgar Casey records and in his readings. And inside there, you can see provable through time since he died now, January 3rd, 1945. That's going back some 77 years. Um, if you go through now the things that he talked about in that period, uh, which seems so like science fiction, so many of them have come to pass, and so many of the things that he talked about in relation to the age of the monuments and how, for example, the Great Pyramid was actually from 10,500 BC and not 2,500 BC. So they lost 8,000 years of history there for starters. Um, Casey is unusual in this sense in that he was a psychic and he was able to medically diagnose those at a distance. Um, and he was most successful originally doing medical readings and later got into kind of super spiritual readings on the metaphysical side. And one of his earliest uh, readings in relation to Atlantis, I think kind of captures uh, just how important this is. In over 900 readings, Casey would bring up the subject of Atlantis out of 14,000 readings given on the record. And by the way, 11,000 not recorded because he wasn't traveling with a stenographer. So how many readings are actually out there? Probably a good another 10 or 11,000. Okay. Um, Casey's story has two very powerful elements in it. Uh, one of them is about this 2 eye crystal, which is a power station that was located there off of Bimini in a place called Poseidia, a large island. That's one piece. Then about the two groups, the Amelius group and the Belial group. The Belial group being what all this Atlantis cult action is about. This is what so many of these elites are trying to capture is this Belial connection. And the Amelius side being this kind of super sensible, super spiritual uh, aspect. These were the two 
sort of battling forces in the Casey cosmology story around Atlantis. This is directly from a Casey reading. Um, on the subject of the lost continent of Atlantis, those conditions, as has been said, much data has been received from time to time through psychic forces as respecting conditions in or through this period. The ages of this continent's existence, that the continent existed, is being proven as a fact. The positions of the continent Atlantis as it occupied is that between the Gulf of Mexico on one hand and the Mediterranean on the other. Evidence of this lost civilization are to be found in the Pyrenees and Morocco on the one hand and British Honduras, Yucatan and America on the other. These are some protruding portions within this that must have at one time or another been a portion of this great continent. The British West Indies or the Bahamas and a portion of same that may be seen in the present if the geological survey would be made of these especially or notably in Bimini. Um, and in the Gulf Stream through this vicinity, these may yet be determined. Later, um, readings would continue along this line. And there was some controversy with these readings because some of the readings that he was doing, uh, he, would, he would always keep copies of these readings. And the third set of readings for a particular group that came to him from New York um, disappeared. So, uh, but the first two sets of readings around Bimini are quite fascinating. They talk about how there's land rising uh, there and that a temple of Poseidia will be seen at a certain point from this land rising. Uh, also that when that land rises, it is going to be concurrent with these other earth changes. He said the first parts of it will be seen in 68 or 69. Well, we found the Bimini wall there, and that's a structure that is very compelling and looks very much uh, like a man-made structure all around Bimini. And um, it looks like a wall. And in fact, uh, Sykes, who I mentioned earlier, said that Bimini was known as the uh, wall temples. So it's quite possible that that's the, the portion that sunk right off of North Bimini. Um, but there are other pieces of this story that are unusual. For example, Casey talked about how there was the presence of something he called the two eye crystal. It's T U A O I. And the two eye crystal was the power source, the power stone for the Atlanteans that they used to power lighter than air vehicles, submersible vehicles, and vehicles that could go through things like fly through mountains. <laughs> Uh, this is how intense the Casey story on Atlantis is. And the Association for Research and Enlightenment, um, they've done great work maintaining his legacy for so many years. But they're kind of afraid of the Atlantis story because it's really quite far out. And it includes occult aspects. It includes super sensible aspects. Science fiction, you know, uh, is how it appears. And yet so much of it uh, is being proven out through Casey's work. Everyone... You're watching the Dark Journalist series. This is X series 118. We're going deep on Ghislaine in the hot zone. And this is uh, the story of Atlantis and how these groups, um, like Maxwell with Terramar and like Epstein there in the hot zone, were all very vested in this idea of Atlantis and the cult of Atlantis, mostly around the Belial aspect and rediscovering their kind of ancient place. This also harkens back to uh, the Ananerba through the Nazis as well, which we've done some shows on with Dr. Joseph Farrell, uh, is doing better. And um, this is very interesting because the Nazis actually sent a group to Central America uh, in the 1930s before major war conditions were going on, and they were looking for evidence of this older culture as well. I want to remind you before we go any further to go to darkjournalist.com and to sign up for a newsletter there. Uh, what we're doing is trying to survive through uh, being on social media, but you know how it goes, here today, gone tomorrow. Uh, the way we can have that direct line with each other is if you're on that newsletter list and um, we'll basically send you, that's a free newsletter, we'll just send you updates and things about once a week about the incredible uh, shows we have coming up for you, some remarkable interviews to watch out for in January and February and some very exciting events that are coming up 
make sure you go to darkjournalist.com. And before we go any further, Miss Olivia. AM wants to know, was Atlantis a hub center for humanity, like the capital of the world? And was it the first world government? Uh, that's interesting. I mean, the way that Casey describes it now, it survives over 200,000 years. You just think of the ups and downs we've had over 200 <laughs> or 250. Um, you know, this is interesting because there are so many stages in Atlantis, but there's definitely a dominant culture there, just like the center of civilization becomes Egypt at a certain point. Uh, so Atlantis was the dominant culture. There were other cultures, uh, for example, Lemuria and the Pacific, according to the mystery schools, also a very advanced culture, an old uh, culture and a, uh, you know, a largely spiritual culture, which also, when the shift happened, when the poles shifted, disappeared beneath the waves of the Pacific, and those aspects can be seen throughout Asia uh, and India. Um, you know, so we're looking at some of the ancient ruins in China, India, and some of those unusual things that we see in relation to Australia. But what's interesting um, that Casey also said that in Death Valley, there were still temples that were parts of Lemuria. So we have a similar kind of culture there, but Atlantis was definitely, uh, we could say the dominant culture for sure. And in terms of the global government, you know, um, it's interesting because Casey talks about a global transmission that went out and he, for once they asked him the actual date and he said 50,722 BC. That's pretty accurate. <laughs> um, but he said, you know, it would be kind of like a worldwide broadcast of its day. And it was all about eliminating the hazard of these large beasts, dinosaurs that were overrunning the earth at that point. Now, here's a real mysterious piece to all this. We know the fascination that the Carnegies have in relation to dinosaurs. We know recently uh, they actually discovered a dinosaur egg that they can reanimate. Mm -hmm. I heard that. Um, but Terrifying. <laughs> Here's a problem. Uh, traditional science says that the dinosaurs were eliminated in 65 million years ago. Casey has the Atlanteans trying to get rid of them 50,722 years ago. He also talks about how we invented them. So uh, you have to wonder if there wasn't also these types of scientific experiments going on back then where they reanimated <laughs> these dinosaurs and they came back and had a big problem with them. I mean, where do you think stories like Jurassic Park come from anyway? <laughs> um, so we have to kind of like, when you get into the Casey work around Atlantis, uh, I can tell you it's very, very edgy. And, you know, we do have this picture, I think the ARE has thrived in this picture of, you know, Casey was a kindly older man and he gave these readings because he just wanted to help humanity and he was a Sunday school teacher and he was. But the nature of the readings is pretty dynamic. And I think that you, you lose a lot of Casey if you just have this kind of like, country doctor, psychic doctor image of him, although I'm sure that was the great love of his life. I think well, that... Well, that's very safe branding. It is. Right? It Father is. of holistic medicine, right? <laughs> exactly. They're not terribly threatening there. Um, very bi um, verifiable information, right, on herbs. And we know so much more about what they do, kind of the chemical constituents. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, we, we have a lot of extraordinary abilities uh, that were witnessed by individuals in Casey's presence. Very unusual. Uh, Casey had remarkable psychic powers. There's, what else can you say about it? He could sleep on a book and read all the contents while asleep so that when he woke up, he knew the contents. Of the I have tried to do that. It does not work <laughs> for me. Um, that's something. That is something. So there's some kind of mechanism there, which is very different, let's say. Um, later, we'll find in the readings that the mystery school figures and even the mystery school that's behind um, working with Casey, because there's a prediction uh, when Steiner is talking about Blavatsky and Blavatsky dying, that the Western initiators from the mystery schools who were trying to work with Blavatsky decided to withdraw before her death because she was having a lot of issues and that they decided they were going to try a different 
avenue. I believe that different avenue is working with the individual Casey and bringing these things out. And let's face it, he really did influence and move the culture to the point where some 70 odd years after his death, we're talking about him here tonight because it's, it's so remarkable. When you get into Atlantis, there's no one with a more complete overview. There's something about the Casey readings that really lock us into that period. Let's see if we can take it even a, a step deeper, a level deeper on this tonight. Um, Casey's story has a couple of essential figures. Um, one of them uh, through this priest, Rata, who uh, comes to Egypt and then works with the Atlanteans to uh, save their records. He finds out all about Emilius, who was the kind of savior of Atlantis. And this um, Rata Emilius story is quite fascinating. What happens is Emilius um, separates himself out. He's the first male in um, that period of time, 200,000 BC, you have two sexes in one. This is what the mystery schools record. And then when you have the splitting of the sexes, you have something very different happening. Um, Emilius is the spiritual character who comes in to retrieve humanity from getting too dense and getting too locked into physical matter. And the a uh, group that grows up around Emilius starts to use the crystals and the two eye crystals to attune themselves to basically the saintly realm, what he calls the outer spheres. So he's getting direct spiritual input and preparing these people, mostly women, um, priestesses to interact with this two eye crystal. Now, on the other side is the same group but a half of this group says, oh, you know what? You can use the same technology for doing things like, you know, flying airplanes, <laughs> lighter than air vehicles. And guess what? Now we can shoot lasers at uh, those tribes that don't like us. So we get into a whole thing where the Belial group starts to develop a um, might is right attitude and mm -hmm. they start to dominate the scene. And the uh, Amelius group is calling them out and they're also preserving the technology and developing it in a totally separate way. So they are developing the crystal technology in a way for spiritual attunement, and the Belial group is using it um, to you know, develop the equivalent of nuclear weapons and things. So it's a totally different, separate philosophy, and the, the wars between these two groups will actually separate the island into three islands. Uh, so the continent they're in the Atlantic Ocean gets separated into three islands. One of the islands is called Poseidia, the other is Arian, and the other is Og. Um, it is in Poseidia that the Law of One group, the Amelius group, uh, thrive and have this kind of incredible period. In that area is all the hot zone ruins, that area uh, that we were talking about in relation to Cuba, and um, before we leave the Casey story on this, let's get a couple of things down solid. This is the hot zone, uh, as we've heard it described. It's in this area uh, where you find these different ruins and things of that nature that if you are going along and you see something and you're working uh, in an official capacity for a company as a private contractor or for the military, you can't mention the ruins that you see there. Um, so on the western tip of Cuba here, something interesting happened, which is um, Paulina Zalitsky, who we mentioned earlier, found an entire Cuban city off that western tip. And as I mentioned, she was called back after having lived in Cuba, defected to Canada, and then started this company, and then Castro asked her back, I find that interesting. Castro shows up in the Maxwell story as well. Uh, and so we're going to find ourselves balancing between geopolitics and esoteric happenings pretty much for the rest of the evening. Which so. is where we like it. <laughs> it's there whether we want to go there or not. So I wanted to ask you this question. Yes. Recent 8432 wanted to know, did Atlantis have a deep state? Uh, well, there's no question that Belial group has the same ethic. And I think what we're seeing rediscovered 
by the kind of elites in the uh, West during the 20th century is this real attitude. But actually, I mean, in the 19th century, it happens a lot through groups like the Orphic Circle that we've discussed, where, um, you know, the prime minister, Disraeli, is part of, um, in the UK, is part of these occult circles trying to find out about the nature of reality, but also about state secrets. And so this occult aspect has to be figured in. Now, there's a lot of fantasy that comes up, you know, in relation to this. And we've seen it through work of different people that the, um, the occult shadow on this, you know, you have to be able to kind of prove what you say or have some sort of breadcrumb trail. And what happens instead is people go off <laughs> fantasizing about this and we don't get anywhere. Um, so we have to kind of do our best with this. Let's think about this in relation to Casey. Casey had a track record of over 40 years of giving readings. Uh, there's 14,000 readings at the ARE Library uh, Center right now that you can go and check out. And there's affidavits of people who were helped by Kathy, uh, Casey's work. The thing is, when we uh, start to look at the amount of things that he got right in relation to geology, geography, medicine, science, history, you have to, you're going into a different thing than somebody's fantasy about something. Now, uh, some people have visions uh, and psychic awareness about it. And if they hone it, they can give us that kind of information. As a matter of fact, I've said, if you don't uh, include the psychic aspect going into this type of material, you're going to be lost. You literally will be. Because if you want to find out about things in relation to ancient humanity and the advanced technology that was going on, you're not going to be able to do it unless you consider and understand the psychic aspect. Um, so what you're going to need is to simultaneously have psychic information, that kind of deep state uh, knowledge is going to be crucial if you're going to understand the geopolitics of it. And um, you're just going to have to have an open mind about it and you're you know not locking yourself into dates or things that we've been given of trying to use scientific sources as far as they go but you know so much of the science has been uh overrun and whenever i went into and, and looked at the story of archaeology as it was i came into it in such an unusual angle that i knew when i read the traditional stuff, oh, they're just doing this because they want to please this and this and this foundation or this guy's in charge. He doesn't want to let that secret out. Uh, very much like the group that was in charge of the Giza Plateau, Zahi Hawass and Mark Lerner and all those people. Um, they just wanted to maintain the public story, get the National Geographic specials. National Geographic comes up a lot tonight. And then you know, they wanted to kind of, it was in their interest to kind of maintain the status quo. So they're not going to step outside the box. And in fact, uh, if they do, I'm sure the punishment is great and they're out of the picture. What is a good thing to keep in mind is a lot of those people that run the Giza Plateau were originally helped out by the Casey Foundation. So think about that for a moment. We're on different terrain. So we start to go in with this wide angle lens in dark journalism and say, in the hot zone, near Cuba, there's a city off the coast there that was discovered. It was run through the media before they could stop it. So that's on record. Now that's a piece we can work with without any fantasy aspect. And then if we track it back with proven psychic results like Casey and we link those things up, we're going into totally different territory. That's how you get answers that are outside of the mainstream narrative, which is crucial because the mainstream, they can always fudge records. So when people say, well, you know, we have to go just go from what's in the, the actual published record. Um, and they do this a lot in relation to the UFO file. Uh, it's not actually true because the, the record, you know, when you go back and study Project Blue Book, for example, you know, so much of that is bunk. So, but that's in the record. You know, so somebody will be like, well, I have the record, Project Blue Book, you know, but it was already a cover program. So you've got a record of a cover program from 50 years ago. That's not good information, <laughs> unfortunately. You know, I'd actually rather have someone 
have an abduction experience and talk to them, it, I think it's actually, you have a better shot at getting something real. Um, so now let's take that into the Cuban story. Let's look at the Cuban ruins for a second now that we've seen a picture of the Hatsa. Okay, so the woman who discovers them, I've described Paulina Zalitsky. We have a couple of programs um, on her and her remarkable findings there in Cuba in 2001. She also has a remarkable personal story. There she is looking at some of the earliest ever drawings in a cave in Cuba, and they are recounting a terrific uh, transformative and catastrophic astronomical alignment, and that still survives. That picture was taken before Paulina found the incredible ruins there in the hot zone. So there's something unusual already in the works going on um, with her. Now, uh, the company that uh, she ran was a deep sea oceanography company. And Castro, as I said, was looking for these Spanish galleons, supposedly. The cover story is that he got her company, he hired their company. So off the coast of Cuba, she found these ruins, which very much look like pyramids and things, um, Egyptian or Mayan. The story goes a lot further even than these pictures, because what we're looking at is she had very advanced submersible vehicles. And when they, when they would go up to the structures, she said, oh, I can see hieroglyphs. And you can see different interviews that take place with Selitsky. And they say, oh, you mean Egyptian hieroglyphs down there? And she said, no, they're, they're Mayan. So it's like an entire Mayan civilization sunk in there off the water. And of course, that edge, Poseidia, leaning toward America, that would become the legacy culture on this side, would be the Mayans. Um, so extraordinary finds that she had, so much so that National Geographic got involved and uh, a number of unusual things started to happen. One of the things that happened was that um, Zelitsky was pushed out by the Cuban Navy. And, you know, after a certain period, she was not given access to the area anymore. Uh, a few things on the record about this Cuban underwater formation. Sonar images interpreted as being symmetrical and geometric stone structures resembling an urban complex were first recorded in early 2001, covering an area of two square kilometers. Now, this is interesting. Um, this is the official discovery in 2001. We brought up um, Hemingway and his brother, Les. And Lester Hemingway, flying over Cuba, had seen this entire city urban center in 1956. So the awareness level is there. We've got 40 years of awareness in relation to this. After studying the images, National Geographic senior editor, John Echave, said they are interesting anomalies. I'm no expert on sonar, and until we're able to actually go down there and see it, it will be di difficult to characterize them. Um, the BBC story, the New York Times stories, lost Cuban city found underwater. Hmm. There's no question that this was explosive and that the ruins there represented not just, hey, there's an interesting temple-like structure, maybe there's something down there, According to Zelitsky, it's a metropolis. It's an entire urban city. So you have lots of ruins. A team of explorers working off the western coast of Cuba say they've discovered what they think are the ruins of a submerged city built thousands of years ago. Researchers from a Canadian company use sophisticated sonar equipment to find and film stone structures more than 2,000 feet below the sea's surface. Now, that's a much, you know, the Bimini ruins are 10 to 15 feet down, you know. So when you're going 2,000 feet down, it's remarkable. They say they still do not understand the exact nature of their discovery. Um, these types of stories were running about Zelitsky and her husband and the ruins, etc. Eventually, as I said, she's pushed out. And actually, um, part of this story ends <laughs> with her getting thrown in a Mexican prison as a scare tactic to keep her away from these things. And in fact, she does flee back to Canada as any of us would. Um, and uh, I've had discussions with her. She's a remarkable person with a remarkable past, whether we can re-engage her on the story of the ruins um, 
is still to be seen, but I think the the odds are that um, there there is going to be a chance to do that. Uh, in this one, peering through her glasses, ocean engineer Polina Zalitsky spent months studying the grainy black and white sonar images on her computer screen, searching for scientific explanation for the fantastic geometric patterns they found 2,000 feet underwater. Suddenly, her eyes caught a calendar by her desk featuring Mayan ruins. Something clicked. Could the massive structures Zalitsky and her husband, Paul Vineswig, stumbled upon? while hunting for sunken treasure really be remnants of an ancient city. Okay, so that is the straight ahead kind of version of this. October 2002 is when these stories are finally coming out. Uh, the finding itself is from 2001. Although, as I said, I, I actually think that so much of this was found earlier. Uh, interestingly enough, that's our space shuttle Atlantis <laughs> hovering over the Bahamas there. And, uh, you know, there's a major space aspect involved with this as well, of course, with the heavy presence of NASA there. And let's not forget that Autech is off the co coast of Andros. So Andros Island right there and Autech being the underwater Area 51. Basically, you know, in the hot zone, we've got a little bit of everyone. <laughs> and the idea is if some of this stuff comes up in international waters, it's anybody's game. And I can tell you that uh, a number of nations have been preparing just for that reality, and they are staking themselves on this idea of New Atlantis. Um, but I can tell you that it's interesting because when we go back, we can see, as I mentioned, this has been around. <laughs> so they're passing this legacy down. Uh, Lester Hemingway created New Atlantis by buying out lots in the Atlantic Ocean. Here is a shot of Lester and his family. It's Christmas greetings from New Atlantis. This was the nation, the ocean nation that he had claimed and discovered. One of the things I found out in my research in the hot zone, of course, is that Ernest Hemingway got readings from Edgar Casey, and that Casey and his family were close to Hemingway's mother. Um, there's some records, uh, letters from Hugh Lynn Casey, Casey's son, talking about how he's going to spend a month there in Chicago with the Hemingways. Well, think about that. What kind of a friend do you have where you're going to go spend a month? It's a little bit, you know, that's a really close-knit relationship. It's not just, I'm dropping by to see these people that I kind of know <laughs> for a weekend. This is, I'm going to stay with them for a month. You're like a member of the family, practically. So Casey's giving all these radical readings about Bimini, and suddenly, in the middle of all that, Ernest Hemingway decides, you know what, I want to live on Bimini, and I want to live on Cuba. Um, one of the things that happens if we go into the biography of Hemingway, especially in the 30s, is that he's going back and forth across from Bimini to Cuba, spending all this time in these scientifically equipped boats looking at the ocean floor. And at first, people thought always fishing. Then later, you know, questions came up about it. And when he was asked about it, he said, oh, I'm looking for German U-boats. Well, there's no weapons anywhere on his ship. So if you found a German U-boat, uh, they basically just blow them out of the water. So those stories were always kind of strange. So the question is, what was he doing down there? How long has this secret about ruins off Cuba been happening? I referred two episodes ago to Thomas Townsend Brown and his presence in Cuba, the western tip of Cuba, and how he would go there every month, and how his daughter and wife thought, you know, he's going down to San Antonio, Texas. Well, it turns out it was San Antonio, Cuba, and they never knew that. Um, one of the things that wonderful western tip has is this very interesting white sand, and it's been theorized that's part of what he was looking for. However, he was sent there originally in 1930, and um, he has all kinds of interesting connections, military and scientific, in that period. And when he goes there, there's an earthquake, there's a hurricane, just devastating, strange things happen uh, in that early period. And he becomes part of an early intelligence unit from the United States into Cuba called the Caroline Group. There's very little known about the Caroline group, and we try to highlight them in a previous episode, uh, X116. So 
I'll leave that there, but keep that in mind as we're going, that there's kind of a generational thing about these Cuban ruins, and that by the time we're getting into the Casey period and talking about this, that's the mystery schools pushing the topic out there saying, watch for these ruins to rise. There's land rising. Keep your eye on that. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show. We're going deep in here. Uh, X Series 118. This is Ghislaine in the hot zone, uh, in the Atlantis hot zone, and the craze in the hot zone. All of the unusual things that Terramar did uh, in relation to looking at these ruins and the great cover story they had about preserving the oceans is going to come out uh, in relation to this episode. And I think that we're opening up an area here which is remarkable because it may be very timely because I don't think the general consensus can be ignorance in relation to the hot zone with all the things going on in relation to Russia. Again, they're talking about putting missiles in Russia and an international incident as a result. Those things that are happening, there's no reason for Cuba to be the political football. There's some other reason here. If we can bring the ancient ruins aspect story and the cult of Atlantis piece up, it may help to actually shield this international incident from happening. Let's see how loud that voice can get out there. Uh, Miss Olivia. Shasha Keela says, I have fished the hot zone. Hooks get stuck on structures below. Ah. And also um, she wanted to know, does the U.S. keep Gitmo to have and keep access to ruins? There's no question. It's very strange, the whole agreement about Gitmo. And, you know, this happened in those periods. There's also the original agreement around Antarctica around that same time. And it's that, oh, we're not going to develop it militarily. All the nations agree to just have it be a scientific exploration zone. Now it seems like everyone wants to blow that because something's been found out there. Um, that's how space was supposed to be, by the way. Remember that? Uh, JFK before the UN? We're not going to have any war in space. Um, and so the foundation of the space program is peaceful exploration of space. They didn't want to bring war into space. Now it's a war fighting domain and you have bellicose uh, rhetoric everywhere on, on it, which is absurd. Um, but mostly that is to secure a kind of grid from space that can control things on the surface. So whenever you hear we need war in space or there's a UFO threat or any of that stuff, remember, they've been planning this stuff for a long time. So always shoot holes in that narrative. Um, yeah. uh, Mike Pannone wants to know who sells those lots to Hemingway. This has been a question that's come up in the past. It's not. This is the thing. Um, there's not one central body that oversees it. Some countries have the ability to do it. And then there are things called domains. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a mixed bag. It depends on where you are, who has the ability to uh, parse out those lots. I know from my own research that John Lennon bought lots in the Atlantic Ocean thinking because he was very into Edgar Cayce and Atlantis, that land was rising there. Um, but I think that's just the tip of the iceberg because those are people that are well known. The stories get out. Who else has really hardcore uh, possession of you know ownership rights of when that land rises? Terramar is very important in relation to this. And that's how we're going it, to, it's kind of the way in for us in looking at the strangeness around the Maxwell case. And also the thing that we're going to bring forward tonight in relation to some of the charges uh, against Epstein and Maxwell, it crisscrosses with the Cousteau family. And the Cousteau family are the premier uh, oceanographers of the world. Jacques Cousteau basically invented it. Um, and in terms of understanding the ocean environment and of the underwater environment, which is the obsession of people like Branson and Epstein and others, uh, we need to look at it from a different perspective. When you find things underwater, first of all, there's a very tight-lipped culture about finding things because there's all these treasure hunters and things like that. But treasure is one thing. If you find entire cities that change the past <laughs> and change the story of humanity, um, you know, what's going to happen? How about this? 
you find incredible power structures, or you find that the laws of physics don't work in certain parts of the ocean. Who gets that information out? If the government doesn't want it out, you're not going to find out about it except through these stories. And things like the Bermuda Triangle, oh, you know what? These planes disappeared. They're gone. They vaporized. These ships went down in this area. Well, um, this is how those stories come back to us. You're not going to get a government body telling you the truth about it. It's like the alien aspect with the UFO thing. There's all these running around stories about UFO disclosure. Government doesn't want to give you anything. The intelligence services would never, ever give up their secret about the real UFO file. Um, but they might be gearing up to give you the false story after studying the, the real thing for so many years. Brandy and Renee says, you think they have would have found the fountain of youth um, the way they literally kill over the area. What? Let's cut to the chase. What's down there? <laughs> what do they want? <laughs> well, what do they possibly all, have already? Let's think about this traditionally. There's tremendous drug running going on in the hot zone. There's a tremendous rush for resources under the water. Uh, one of the very interesting things that Casey said in relation to Bimini is that if Bimini was studied properly, that you would find more gold around Bimini in the Gulf Stream than anywhere else in the entire world. So let's think about that. He's saying we're looking at something totally different and we're looking at a, a possibility that there's gold there, but then he's talking about ruins and things like that. So it's a totally different type of discussion. And some of those readings have to do with pirate treasure that was stashed away. There are rumors about that. Well, it's interesting because there are rumors about bootleggers who in the late 20s were using Bimini to, you know, as a storehouse for bootlegging booze into Miami and that they discovered ancient ruins by accident. And then, <laughs> you know, these stories have been going around since the, the 20s on this. So there's something about Bimini and there's something about the hot zone, which is going to give us in a completely different type of history, if we look at it. Uh, let's wrap up the Hemingway section. In Miami, Ernest's brother, Les Hemingway, founded a micronation, hosted seances, and hunted Nazis. The micronation was New Atlantis. And um, he certainly, from his own experience and from his brother's experience and from the Casey readings, had this idea that land is rising here and he's thinking that land will rise. No nation will be able to claim it. I'll start a new nation. We'll start basically, you know, we'll renew things all over again. We won't make the mistakes that these other people made. That's where you get the new Atlantis. That's the piece. Okay. Let's talk about the really esoteric aspect here for a mo moment with Casey and the two eye stone. Casey in a series of readings talks about a two eye stone. Uh, and this is the stone that the Atlanteans use as their power source. There's an alternate version that he talks about with this. He calls it a firestone, which is the kind of miniature version. There was a NASA engineer who became so fascinated with these readings that in the 1970s, he decided to create scale models of the two eye stone. And this is what he came up with. That's what we're looking at. It's a six sided figure and it's, operated by sun through facets of crystal. So the two eye stone becomes the main power source as the Belial group sort of overtakes the Amelius group. And then the Belial group get greedy with it and actually accidentally set off the equivalent of a massive nuclear explosion, which sets off all these volcanoes. You know, we just had this incredible Tonga volcano, which what did it look like when it came up? It looked like a mushroom cloud. Well, this is exactly what Casey is referring to. And he, he talks about it setting off the fires in the earth and things of this nature. Um, and we also have to imagine the environment, say in 50,000 BC, quite different. Um, Casey's story of Atlantis is a very advanced technological culture. And they had air travel, they had television, they had photography, they had the ability to go through objects. What kind of technology is that? 
And um, from what he described, it sounds like they had a space program. He said they could go anywhere in the universe. Um, in speaking about the priestesses who were prepared, he talks about, oh, those preparing to greet those coming in from other planets. It's one of the only readings where Casey makes direct reference to aliens. Um, so there's something big and fantastic in the middle of all that. And you can see Casey as a Sunday school teacher and being in this kind of very Christian religious environment, um, how radical a lot of this must have sounded in 1925. So, um, you know, those readings he continues to give and they, they build an incredible body of work, but he goes through a lot of personal difficulty as the result of it, because he is alienated by different church bodies and things like that. What happens is sometime around 1928, a group comes forward and says, we want business readings in relation to Bimini. And this group comes down and they actually are like, you know what, these readings are so good, we're gonna take you to Bimini. And, you know, we're gonna have you actually discover these things. This is one of the few times where, you know, the business people will actually take, I mean, they take him to New York and places, but to actually take him to Bimini Island is a little unusual. Um, what happens is something in Casey's unconscious picks up that the people who are asking for the readings are up to no good. <laughs> And, um, but nonetheless, during the, the quality of the period of this, the readings are so finely detailed, talking about the ruins that are off Bimini, that are from Poseidia and the temple of Poseidia that's gonna rise again. Um, and it gets into this whole aspect. What happens uh, to the third set of readings, as I said, when they get back from Bimini to Miami, there's another set of readings and um, so you have all these powerful readings about the Atlantean culture and the two eyes stone and the Poseidia and everything really explosive a couple of sets of readings by the third set of readings. These businessmen are kind of starting to show themselves and they actually steal a copy that the Casey readings uh, kept as part of their library. So what happens is the company basically disappears in case he doesn't hear from them and they're off the map. Then suddenly four, three or four years later, he's in New York and he's giving a lecture and those business guys are there in the audience again. Suddenly they're back and he's like, Oh, there they are. They're in the audience. I'm going to talk to them once this is over. I guess they've come back to talk to me. He finishes the lecture. He goes off stage. They're gone again. They're still looking for details. And they have decided, oh, you know what? It's better actually if we just don't engage with him anymore because he's starting psychically to figure out what we're all about. Um, so there's something very unusual going on there. The next piece in relation to uh, Casey and the deep state is when the CIA on record in 1964 places their operatives inside the ARE to find out specifically about the Hall of Records Atlantean Temple. Um, that comes out of CIA records, so it, it can't be questioned in this sense of somebody thinking, oh, the CIA were trying to do it. Their own records say that they were doing it. Why on earth they let those records out is, is interesting and mysterious. But nonetheless, we have this trail of intelligence, military, deep state work around the occult, uh, esoteric vision of Casey. And when we get it into Atlantis, we start to see why they were so curious and maybe even paranoid about it. Um, one of the things I want to point out is as we go, as we start to move into the Maxwell section of this, we have the foundation. We understand now that there's something in the hot zone that is um, on the record that people, major figures in literary history like Hemingway spent years around it, um, that it became part of a geopolitical incident during the Kennedy administration when he was trying to get Hemingway's uh, searches for Atlantis out of Cuba that were in a vault there and where Mary Hemingway got him to do this and that a document came out, was all about this, it only came out as recently as 2014, where Kennedy is discussing an international incident that needs, that could be set off by happening at the villa of Ernest Hemingway. Um, so we've got a lot of pieces that are already on the record in relation to it. And then we have the deep, close relationship of Hemingway 
with Casey. And then further back, you have the Caroline group, which is already operating kind of off the books, doing gravity experiments, deep sea submersibles in 1930. And you have T.T. Brown working with the Caroline group. I've uh, posited that Hemingway and JFK were also involved in the Caroline group, which brings the picture together. Let's see if we can bring more pieces of the picture together about how the Maxwell story links up with this. Everyone, you're watching The Dark Journalist Show. This is uh, X Series 118. We're going deep tonight into the hot zone with Ghislaine Maxwell, Edgar Casey, and Terramar, the nonprofit Ocean Projects. We're going to find a very interesting piece, and in some of the details become salacious about how it came out, but nonetheless, it's a gift for us, and it's all about Cousteau, in this case, the granddaughter of the great Jacques Cousteau, Alexandra Cousteau, who has a very impressive track record herself in ocean preservation, but unfortunately got mixed up with uh, the likes of the Maxwell Epstein gang. Uh, so we're going to get into her, and that's going to open up a whole different level. Before we go there, Miss Olivia, you're up. Um, two Eye Stone is always interesting. Um, World Change Brief says, do we know if the Two Eye Stone was natural or engineered by Atlanteans or others? That's an excellent question. Um, since it was six-sided uh, with facets and was kept... The way Casey described it is actually quite remarkable. There's a dome that they roll back, you know, when the sun comes up, they have this thing come out and it sort of gets all of these power stations going through radioactivity from those stars that are on fires themselves. I actually have a quote here when he's talking about it. He says, the Firestone not only provided power, but it accomplished other things through the same form of fire the bodies of individuals were regenerated by the burning. Through the application of the rays from the stone, the influences that brought destructive forces to an animal organism. Hence, the body rejuvenated itself often and remained in that land until the eventual destruction of Poseidia, joining with the peoples that made for the breaking up of the land, joining with Belial, the Belial group for the final destruction of the land. So, so you understand the context there. Casey is going into the person's past life and he's saying, you were in Atlantis. This was the war that was going on. This is your experience. So the reincarnation piece was also something quite dramatic for a Sunday school teacher to be bringing out. But Casey basically understood that the information was opening up to him. So he was broad-minded enough not to say, oh, I can't accept that because I'm a Christian. And he certainly... Um, his whole life, you know, had been in that Christian, the churches and teaching school. Um, and Casey's rather fascinating. I don't think it's understood that he was a photographer for the kind of greater portion of his life and that he was not in the habit with his psychic readings of saying, well, you know, <laughs> you're going to get a psychic reading with me and it's only going to cost you $900 or something. I mean, he was basically, you know, um, he made himself available to whoever came to him. And certainly the readings eventually did help him uh, quite a bit as people who were well off found out about him. But most of his life he spent poor and, and he didn't die uh, wealthy or anything like that. As a matter of fact, his entire life was a struggle. So we, we need to keep that in mind when we get around psychic activity too. There's a kind of, um, well, there's a pure quality to it. And I think that he was more concerned um, with getting the information and moving the culture forward and having that spiritual force come through him and everything else seemed secondary. You know, I remember there's a story there about his son, Hugh Lynn, visiting him. And he realizes when his dad goes to pick him up from the train that he has newspaper inside his jacket, keeping himself warm. So Casey didn't even have enough to have a good coat in the winter. You know, so we have to get real about the quality of the work of Casey and his dedication versus, you know, what we might see in a, in a kind of traditional thing. Uh, and he encouraged people to develop their psychic uh, abilities. And he said that everyone has psychic abilities. So let's keep that in mind. Um, now, how does, how do we get, how are we going to then take our knowledge, the foundation of the hot zone and bring it into these kind of um, very, very sketchy 
goings on uh, of Ghislaine Maxwell. Well, we have to understand a few things about Maxwell also. Um, she's a very unusual family and her dad is very unusual. Uh, and he spends most of his time on these yachts. So he's, he's on the water all the time. Like the Custos are on the water. Ghislaine is on the water. You know, she uh, is an excellent submarine pilot. So I mean, who is a sub, <laughs> particularly as a woman, but like how many people are submarine pilots? Do you call them pilots? Who um, Exactly. Who aren't part of the military. True. It's weird. It is weird. Um, the other thing is that if you go through her various conversations, and I have some of them here and I'm going to read them, um, she talks about how the figure that inspired her to do all this was Jacques Cousteau, the master of the undersea world. And what was Jacques Cousteau's great quest? Well, it was the quest for Atlantis underwater, of course. And so that starts to give us some of those hints and indications. You know, I actually, I'm going to go directly to some of the unusual things about Cousteau and then uh, jump into Maxwell. Here's an interesting piece about Jacques Cousteau. Jacques Cousteau developed some of the most advanced submersibles in the 50s and 60s. And he also, um, you know, he wanted to find ancient ruins underwater and he made it a family affair with his son, Philippe. And they would go around the world looking for uh, different ruins. He'd go to Lake Titicaca, for example, and uh, he would go into the Bahamas, Crete, uh, Santorini, the Mediterranean. He was worldwide seafarer. And he became, you know, very well known through this. And he had a series of television specials. There's a six part television special, which is still legendary. And I think you can get most of it on YouTube. And it is all about his search for Atlantis. And there's a Bahamas piece. Now, in 1977, there was a researcher named David Zink, who found pillars off of Bimini. Some of them lit up the ocean floor. So he was very curious about what they were. And he decided to employ a team of psychics as well as people who were oceanographers. Uh, I did a, an interview with his widow and um, she revealed all kinds of interesting things about their searches. Well, here is um, Philippe Cousteau with David Zink in that very same Search for Atlantis special. And Zink is looking directly in the Bahamas for the Stones of Atlantis. He's looking at the Bimini Wall. He's in Bimini. He is there in the hot zone because he realizes the ancient ruins are down there. And he's also employing psychic teams. And here we have, right in the middle of it, Cousteau's son. Now, Cousteau's son, Philippe, is the father of Alexandra. Uh, this is Alexandra Cousteau, who, as I said, has done a remarkable job in bringing preservation of the oceans um, forward. Now, Alexandra, um, you know, she's been, I would say, over the course of the last 15 or 20 years, involved with so many ocean preservation projects. Um, and I think that a number of them have turned to her because of her name. And, you know, they, they really try to bring that aspect out. Um, her brother as well has a show on the Travel Channel, Looking in the Hot Zone. Uh, it's, his name is Philippe also. And he is looking for Spanish galleons, wrecks in the hot zone. And he and his wife have this whole program going around the hot zone in this boat. Um, Alexandra stepped into some controversy through what came about um, through the testimony of Virginia Giuffre. Now, um, for those of you who don't know, in the Epstein case, uh, Giuffre brought forward the charges, for example, against Prince Andrew. And um, there you can see Giuffre with Ghislaine in the background. And there's Prince Andrew. Um, her story, and, you know, people have certainly covered this very deeply, but to just kind of hit some solid bullet points on it, basically, since the age of 15, they had used her as a sexual slave, and that she was 
sort of brought into this cult by Maxwell and she would meet all these very high-end people um, being there on St. James Island. Now, um, they would also use her in various ways um, to set up uh, all these contacts. And she would talk about orgies and very high-end people being involved. One you going to name any names? Uh, well, I, I will. Okay. Uh, but one of the interesting things that came out of her testimony, and it's here, um, this is out of the Independent in London. Jufre alleged that she gave massages to marine activist Alexandra Cousteau, the granddaughter of explorer Jacques Cousteau, several times during their first meeting. Some salacious details here. She also said that Epstein instigated that she and I reenact as lovers in lesbian acts of foreplay, saying that Epstein claimed to have donated to Cousteau's marine exploration projects. Okay, so this, this is, there's a few things to unpack here. One of the most important pieces to Epstein's operation, in my opinion, has to do with the blackmail aspect. But you can blackmail people for different reasons. So now, um, one of the things that we knew that Epstein was obsessed with was eugenics. That's one piece. Another piece that we know he's obsessed with is... Atlantis, as uh, Maxwell was. Whether or not her dad was is also interesting because I have books published by Pergamon Press, which her dad ran, which are all about Atlantis too, surveying the ocean floor. Um, there's a piece here that if we can get to it, you know, what happens is the things that Epstein did with his cult were so outrageous and there's so many high-level figures involved, we can really see, on one hand, a high-end blackmailing, um, you know, we could call him almost a high-end pimp uh, from this, and the association he had with Harvard over here, he would spend time in an office about five or six minutes from here, and he was donating to groups here at MIT, and it was all about this kind of Superman uh, thing relating to eugenics and sperm and all these different types of things. So let's think of what he's getting from being a part of having Cousteau involved. Now, some people have said, oh, Cousteau couldn't have been involved, and Giuffre is just saying that, she's making it up. Well, you know, she talks about Heidi Klum and people of this nature, but why would you bring in Alexandra Cousteau? It would seem like an odd thing to do since Alexandra Cousteau, aside from those ocean preservation circles, is not particularly well known. So that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, but let's see for the record what Cousteau's response was through her lawyers. Quote, the allegations by Virginia Giuffre, Nee Roberts, regarding Ms. Cousteau are 100% false, Cousteau's lawyer said in an email. Ms. Gusteau never had intimate relations with Giuffre and does not even recall ever having met such a person. Ms. Gusteau and her organization also never received any financial contributions whatsoever from Mr. Epstein or his company. Now, it was discovered by the Independent in searching through records that Epstein had, in fact, donated to the Gusteau organization, um, but not specifically yet that they could find to Alexandra. Nonetheless, there's no crime in taking a uh, contribution. That's not the point. It's more about what kind of leverage was he seeking. This is where we, I think we need to get to. Uh, and I think it is very tricky territory as well, because what's happening is if you grab someone, and uh, I'm going to speculate for a moment here, if you're Epstein and you're trying to get information about Atlantis, you may go directly to the source, which is Jacques Cousteau spent his entire life underwater. His family knows about ruins, especially ruins in the hot zone. So you may think there's certain secrets they won't give up. I'll get friendly with them. I'll butter them up. I'll financially try to do things in position. But if I can get blackmail on them and really force them to give me those secrets in a hurry, maybe that's even better. So this is how I see that playing out. I see them sucking in different people um, and those people being dazzled by models, celebrities, President Clinton, 
Prince Andrew, you know, um, and the, the really kind of bedazzling thing that goes on. Jufre said something very interesting is that she developed a good relationship, friendship with Cousteau and that Cousteau did things like taught her, you know, how to really swim well, and that they almost died together while swimming too far out. You know, I mean, so there's a lot of, it, it's not just some salacious comment and she drops it. She has a real background on it. Now, um, there are, you know, there's a series of witnesses in relation to the Epstein case and people have really dived into that. Um, what I can say is that the figure of Cousteau being in the middle of this Epstein Maxwell piece intrigues me because of what I know about them and the search for Atlantis. And it makes sense to me that they would make a major play to get Alexandra involved in their search and their quest to be the heirs to the Belial cult in Atlantis. This piece, I think, develops very strongly through that testimony. Um, and, you know, so people will have their different opinions about uh, the witnesses, et cetera. Here's a few other unusual things about Alexandra. Um, and I, I actually have reached out to the Custos to try to get some background on this. So anything that I'm putting out here today is I'm open for more information. So if, if they have something that they want to put on the record, uh, then I'm happy to hear it 100% and I'd be delighted to have them on. This is uh, Philippe which is her dad, and um, her dad, Jacques Cousteau's son, died tragically when she was four. Now, here's another really tough piece. Remember that he was working with Zinc in the hot zone directly around these ruins, and Zinc was absolutely convinced, if you read that book, The Stones of Atlantis, that he was onto the piece. He was there in the hot zone. He had the compass spinning backwards, in certain areas, he started, he was starting to figure things out. So that information locked in with Philippe Cousteau's information is pretty powerful. So his death, although ruled an accident, was investigated by three different law enforcement groups who weren't satisfied with the story. And then the traditional um, story that, oh, he was killed while checking on something in a plane doesn't wash. The plane was actually flying and went down in water. And they're like, well, he was an excellent pilot. We're not sure how this happened. And they couldn't find any malfunctions in the plane. The police deemed it suspicious. So something was going on there. And uh, this, you know, we're talking 1979, 1980. Um, he's working and doing that special with the zinc in 77, 78. So, you know, if you look at it, you'll notice that the entire Cousteau Atlantis piece and the big push, even from Zinc, kind of goes south after that. And a lot of things about the hot zone go very quiet. Um, it's not really until, you know, a kind of a, you know, a renaissance of ideas kicks in. Um, it takes a long time to restart that kind of uh, motion that was taking place in the 70s. I would say in relation to disclosure, um, and also in relation to this Atlantis piece. So we have something very unusual going on in relation to his death, in my opinion. Um, it's always tough, I think, to say that. Um, one of the things that Cousteau developed was called the uh, deep sea saucer or the X saucer. <laughs> this thing looked like a flying saucer underwater. And he developed it in the late 50s. Deep Star was the name of it. Um, and it's an unusual setup for sure. Um, but apparently Why it worked it out real well. Why would it be called a Deep Star? It Excellent just, point. I yeah. just thought about that. Like, what does a star <laughs> have to do with the ocean? That's weird. It is weird. I agree with you 100%. Um, the other thing that's strange about it, I would say, is that this whole saucer piece, this is a more modern version of it and they still use it and when you're going deep sea submersible you're using this stuff mm. um i would also say that um when we have people like branson by the way whose island was just across from epstein island 
Um, you know, we're, we're also talking about somebody who is exploring these large sinkholes and he's going right off the coast of the Yucatan to do it. Um, you know, <laughs> hold on a sec, Groovy Bean yeah. says, what's weirder is that it reads rat speed backwards. <laughs> <laughs> Only Groovy Bean. It's great to have Groovy Bean out there. Um, here's, uh, you know, I, again, I think when we're looking at Alexandra, we're in an, an interesting area there because she's obviously tried to move on and not deal with this um, and through her lawyers hasn't said anything. But for us, with our knowledge of the hot zone and then thinking about Epstein, we've got a thread here now um, that if we can really sort of get into it and push past the, um, the controversy, which is definitely something that is going to be sorted out, my guess is I have something here, honestly, which comes out of court records and it's been floating around on the internet for the past couple of weeks since the trial wrapped up. Um, and of course, Ghislaine Maxwell is under sentencing. Now they're gonna sentence her in June uh, after she was found guilty of human trafficking. And yet, um, as is being pointed out, they're not prosecuting anybody that she trafficked these underage women too. So there's a big problem with this case anyway, but that's when the sentencing is taking place. And um, no doubt people are watching her and her security and her safety because of what happened to Epstein and the incredible backlog of information that she, she must have. Um, but in her, in Jeffrey Epstein's black book is the phone number, which I have here of Alexandra Cousteau. So there's no question there's communication between those two. How far that communication went, well, we know he contributed to uh, the Cousteau Foundation, although not Alexandra personally. And we know, um, you know, he, if you look at um, the story of Jufre, we know all of these things that she claims in relation to a relationship that happened. And that she doesn't say that. Um, Alexandra Cousteau was around a lot. She just talks about these kind of three or four occasions and this developing thing that Epstein was trying to do, having her around. Let's take it back and think to ourselves for a moment. Remember, Zinc had a big key to the hot stone. Uh, he, in collaboration with Philippe, they probably had it worked out as to where some of the stuff was and what it could do. So um, the fact that we can kind of thread these things across 40 years of time and find ourselves somehow with a break in a strange way through this memory of this salacious thing that happened and Jufre putting it on the record and saying, well, actually Cousteau's granddaughter, you know, Epstein was involved with her. He, he said he was donating money to her. He told Jufre that. So we have it there. Now let's think about his motivations. Again, he wants to get, this information about the hot zone and who's got that information? Well, the family members, <laughs> the Cousteau family, because as I said, Cousteau lived underwater and he was doing what? Searching for Atlantis. Um, so that that's gonna kind of put us in a different mindset about this. I was looking at quotes that Philippe was making, a uh, Philippe Jr. Um, and that's Alexander's brother in talking about you know, his show and things like that. So he got interviewed and they said, you know, was um, Jacques very concerned with ocean preservation and things like that? And he said, well, really, to be honest with you, you know, the thing that he was obsessed with was finding Atlantis, you know? <laughs> so that's straight from the horse's mouth. I mean, he has things with search for Atlantis, but if his son is saying, look, this is what the guy was about. We know that Cousteau is right there in the middle of this search. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show. We're going deep tonight. X Series 118, Ghislaine Maxwell, the craze in the hot zone, or the Atlantis craze in the hot zone. We're going to be taking your questions in the second part of the program here. Coming up, probably run a little bit late tonight with so much information. Before I go any further, Miss Olivia. Great question. Juan Pablo Perez Calvo. Would like to know from Daniel, does he think the ocean star, deep star, was finding stargates in the ocean? There's many experiments with this notion of tunnels and wormholes in the ocean. Yes, uh, that actually goes directly to the Thomas Townsend Brown information. If 
if you watch X series 116 and X series 43, both of them uh, have information in relation to what are called stargates and then what T.T. Brown was doing and how the two types of information correlate. One of the stories that sticks with me is, of course, uh, my conversation with his daughter, who's done remarkable work trying to get his story out through difficulty. And um, Linda told me that uh, she had an experience where he told her, hey, I want you to drive out to this place in the desert. You're going to see a glass elevator there when you something that looks like an elevator when you get there go into it and she drove out to where he said to go and she got into this glass elevator and it seemed to go up like an elevator but she felt almost like i'm in a dream or something it was a strange feeling and then when she got out she was in a totally different place so um that along with other things in relation to thomas townsend brown I think gives us a hint about that type of technology that the ancients called the Stargate. Um, I would also say this about Brown, which is if he's spending so much time on the western tip of Cuba, and on that western tip uh, under the waters where they find those ruins, again, we're looking at a connection between the two. So uh, let's keep that in mind. There's something about that western tip of Cuba that is a signaling for us. You know, remember Brown was going there. He was making these trips with Robert Sarbarker, who was a top physicist. And this guy has been basically written out of history. You can't even find a Wikipedia entry. And I think the first time I mentioned that was like four years ago, and there still isn't one. <laughs> I don't know if people have tried to put it up, but uh, it's a weird thing, isn't it? I mean, you hear all about Einstein, and, you know, you can't get away from this stuff. This guy was major. Uh, in the 40s and 50s, and you cannot, you can't find much about him anymore. His big sin was in the 1980s, well, actually originally 1950, but in the 80s, he came forward and said, oh yeah, we worked on the UFO file. It was me, Vannevar Bush, and some other guys. We examined crash wreckage. We went through it. We tested it. We found the beings inside. They were insect-like. I guess that's how they absorbed all the G-force and all the rest of it. I don't know why this isn't out already. Um, so he has a very unusual ending as well, which is he, you know, after he, he does this and puts it on the record, and then Stanton Friedman calls him up in the 80s and said, did you put this on the record? He says, yeah. Um, and he lived up here and, and in Florida. But um, in any case, one day he goes out to his car. There's something like jelly on his car handle, door handle, and... He feels weird after he touches it. He calls his son up and says, oh, something weird was on my door. Now I drove to the hospital and then he dies. So, um, you know, certainly uh, loose lips sink UFO ships uh, on that one. So we've got something strange going on. But Sarbarker Barker is the one there with Thomas Townsend Brown, the scientist who dealt with a lot of black projects that the United States government was working on in Cuba, in San Antonio, Cuba, on that western tip. What were they doing? We don't know. Question? Yes. Um, World Change Brief wants to know, where did she end up? Did she ever say at the end of that escalator kind of Yes. She, she ended up um, basically on a beach. <laughs> and it was like she was there for three hours. It was a nice, wonderful beach. It's almost like, let's say um, that she went from a desert in California to a beachfront in California, the jump was made. She she had the impression that she, it was on the Mediterranean, and this could very well be. So, um, you know, we hear a lot of people talk about, you know, the ability to jump through star uh, portals and things of this nature. Well, look, there's a real aspect to this in the work of T.T. Brown, and then there's people who just heard a story about it and like to kind of roll that into uh, the thing. So you have people who are like, I'm a time traveler. <laughs> um, I think if people who are like time travelers or things like that, if we have them among us, I don't think we're going to find out, you know, in our lifetime <laughs> about that. Um, so, but it is interesting, isn't it? Uh, when we get into the work of Brown, he asks, um, you know, his daughter's boyfriend, if he believes in time travel, 
and um, the boyfriend says, well, you know, I think so, yeah. And he said, well, what would you do if you could travel back in time? And uh, her boyfriend says, well, I think I'd save my um, sister who died when she was young. And Thomas Townsend Brown says, well, you know, there's some rules against changing things like that, but what else would you do? And um, at a certain point when the conversation is over, he says, in your lifetime, you're going to see this. We have the ability to do this. So there's something very unusual uh, in relation to Brown and the Caroline group and the things that they discovered. And the core, the, t the amount of time that they spent in the hot zone convinces me that's where those discoveries took place. All right. Uh, anything else? Thomas Tyson says, why was Graham Hancock, with, without near, nearly the funding of Cousteau, able to find so much more underwater evidence? Hmm. Um, well, I mean, I think he certainly built off of some of Cousteau's work. And um, I mean, Cousteau has an incredible record of things that he discovered. But I think that, um, you know, the only thing I can say about Graham is he was very uh, determined um, to find the evidence of this lost civilization. He still is. You know, this guy's remarkable. So, uh, but yeah, that's a, it's a good well, question. I, mean, I think the implication is that he was an independent operator and he could reveal the information, whereas Cousteau could not. Yeah, that's the other thing, which is we have to remember this when we get around this subject which is, like I said, in relation to finding things, there's a whole different set of rules on the ocean. <laughs> and, you know, regular laws don't really apply. That's where you get pirates and everything else. There's all kinds of drug smuggling that's going on. Um, they're in the hot zone. Forget it. It's an incredible crisscross of geopolitical action, drug smuggling, looking for ancient ruins, the two eye stone, <laughs> this incredible apotheum leftover effect that you get with the Bermuda Triangle. Um, so you, you know, you, you have whole cities that have been discovered on the record now off Cuba, but we still don't have access to any of this stuff. So, you know, we hear about things and they're like, oh, um, you know, they found something. At, it's like a, a piece of an Aztec temple and it's 400, you know, AD or something like that. And you have all this investigation, all this stuff around it. It's fascinating. I love those stories. Why the heck isn't anything going on in relation to Zelitsky's find of an entire city off Cuba? It makes no sense. Um, where's National Geographic now? There's a lot of weird things about National Geographic. Um, one of the interesting things, if we look back at their history, is you know they've had people on their boards like Earl Warren, who <laughs> ran the Warren Commission. I mean, I don't think that these are the people that are going to be opening up and there's no explanation for that, right? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Suddenly he developed an interest in explorations. Um, so, all right, let's go now. Let's make the jump to light speed <laughs> and find out some anomalies, Cuba, and then bring it into Maxwell. Okay, well, this starts off with Epstein. Fidel Castro invited Jeffrey Epstein to Cuba, former Colombian president says. Here's the thing. Nobody knew this. So this is something that Colombian president put on the record. Jeffrey Epstein, the billionaire accused of sex trafficking minors and committed suicide in a federal prison in Manhattan, traveled to Cuba at the invitation of Fidel Castro, according to Colombian president Andre Pastrana. Okay, on the record, now we have it solid that Epstein was there with Cuba uh, and with Castro in Cuba. Okay, there's a number of things they could have been talking about, but who wants to take bets that Epstein was talking to him about the underwater city that he had found off the western tip? Um, then Pastrana actually says he accompanied him on the trip. <laughs> so uh, there's no question that there's a Castro-Epstein connection. Now, a lot of people um, in looking at this show and even at this story are going to say, well, there's all this stuff with Mossad and Epstein and all that. It's true. And just like Robert Maxwell and Ghislaine, there's a gigantic Mossad connection. And uh, Robert Maxwell may have been working for three or four intelligence agencies. It's there. It's in the, the kind of, uh, you know, DNA of this story. So um, 
but Epstein in going to Cuba, I think we're looking at things, we're trying to find what they're doing in the hot zone. And we're, when we look at him with Cousteau and then we look at him with Castro, and then we look at some of these other things we're gonna find, including his submarine called Atlantis and the scientists that he was inviting aboard to do these types of trips, deep underwater trips, uh, to look at something <laughs> and then to combine that with our knowledge about Terramar, which we're gonna get into in a minute here, we're gonna see things a little bit differently. So very often when we look at Epstein, you know, we'll think predator, sexual predator, Mossad, and we're kind of locked there. That's an important piece, but what else? What else do we have? Is this somebody who was in the hot zone looking for evidence of Atlantis because they're all part of a Belial cult? And they want access to those ancient ruins, not just for the two eye stone information, but because they want to reconnect with this kind of Superman idea and Belial. Um, I'm going to show how this makes sense, and it's going to bring us into the minds of how these people think, and maybe open up our eyes about it. Um, so I think that the things that the researchers have brought forward about the blackmail. Um, the human trafficking, all the things around Epstein, this is very important. But there's a second story around him too. And it's the eugenics piece, which as I said, he studied and supported over here um, at Harvard. And then there's also the Atlantis cult. If we don't understand those two pieces, we're gonna be missing a big part of this. All right. Um, but to get into some of the traditional things around them, okay, we have their names. Epstein brought eight women with him to visit at Clinton White House. The notorious Jeffrey Epstein visited the Clinton White House over a dozen times with over a half dozen different women between 1993 and 1995. This relationship with Clinton supplying him with women, the power dynamic um, was already well established in the early 90s with Epstein. Beginning shortly after Clinton's inauguration in 93, Epstein made the first of 17 visits to the White Ugh. House. This guy is right there in the heart of the thing. Bringing along at least four known girlfriends and several other female companions, according to a report from the British outlet. Much of Epstein's private life has come to light in recent months amid the trial <laughs> of accused former madam, Ghislaine Maxwell. That's a polite way to put mm -hmm. it. Madam? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, what do you got? Oh, no, it's it's pretty dirty. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll keep going. We'll keep going. Um, here's something. Remember the eugenics piece I was mentioning? Check this out. Exclusive. The girls couldn't be black. Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell ordered victim Virginia Jufre to recruit young white girls. And if they weren't white, they had to be exotically beautiful, unsealed docs reveal. Um, there's an Aryan obsession in the eugenics piece around this, and that's giving us, it's just a little hint, and this is the value, I think, in Giuffre's, uh testimony around Epstein, or just these little things that she's not even, it doesn't even seem like that's the explosive thing, just like the Cousteau part. She's just, you know, that's not really a big figure for her to be mentioning and to really telling us about. But she's putting Cousteau on that map so that we understand Epstein was trying to manipulate Cousteau. And then she's putting this piece on the map, which is that the, they had this fixation that the girls be white. Uh, this, of course, is the classic picture. I'm going to read it as I show it here. That is Stephen Hawking photographed in March 2006 aboard an Atlantis submarine that was custom fitted by Epstein to accommodate his wheelchair. Hawking was attending the conference confronting gravity, a workshop to explore fundamental questions in physics and cosmology sponsored by the Epstein foundation and the center for education and research in cosmology and astrophysics, uh, case Western reserve university at the Ritz Carlton, St. Thomas. This is very important. Um, so Epstein in the palm of his hand has, President Clinton. He has all well, these models, Prince Andrew, but now the scientific community also. So we think about the scientific community that is there with him, but where are they? They're in a submarine where? In the hot zone. What are they doing? What are they doing in the submarine? 
why does Ghislaine Maxwell have an ocean preservation? This is somebody who basically was a madam, as they said. Um, and her dad was a spy, and he defrauded all the people in his company before his body was found floating off this yacht nude. This is not somebody who is obsessed with ocean preservation. Why are they down there in the hot zone with the top scientists of the world in a submarine called Atlantis? Why is this guy visiting Castro where they've just found off the coast of Cuba an entire underwater city? And then they push out the chief researchers and this guy shows up. Uh, these are the questions that we need to answer in relation to this. And I'm also going to play with the cover story here which is, here's an article on Ghislaine Maxwell about the world's oceans. It's a couple of key points in it I want to bring forward. Uh, yeah, what do you got? This is really interesting. So SOS is asking, so Maxwell never had dealings in the Pacific? Were her, all of this is isolated to the hot zone? No. Uh, I mean, well, Cousteau, for example, there's, there's all kinds of uh, Pacific activity. And um, with Alexandra Cousteau, she has a whole program dedicated to it. Um, the, uh, but Maxwell is a Terramar. She's been all around the world. But Epstein and Maxwell are there in the hot zone. And the scientific engagement that they're doing with the submarine takes place there in the hot zone. Bill Gates is there at that island in the hot zone. You know, so uh, the focus is, I, I would say, has she been around the world? Did she do other explorations? Sure, but at the hardcore piece is right there. Uh, no, no question about it. Okay, here's the cover story. After a lifetime of diving and marine exploration, a hobby has become a calling for Ghislaine Maxwell, who's on a mission to clean up the seas. Now, this was the PR that she was putting out there, and this was the PR that these people were using, uh, she was going to be the great savior of the oceans. Terramar was going to be its own ocean nation worldwide, and everyone could be a citizen of Terramar. Um, interestingly enough, that flag of Terramar, which I find interesting, was developed by the same guy who did the Hope poster for Obama. So... <laughs> The connections run good. Uh, we're going to find Terramar Obama overlaps as well as we get a little deeper in here. Uh, let's see how I'm doing for time. <laughs> okay, let's see. I'm going to get through this. This article um, comes from October 2015, so it's before she's outed in a full way. As a little girl, Ghislaine Maxwell watched Jacques Cousteau on television while having her tea and was mesmerized by what she saw, thus began a lifelong love of the ocean. So right off the bat, it's Cousteau. Uh, she actually started scuba diving when she was nine off the coast of France. Quote, back then, you didn't need a qualification of any sort. Today, it would be impossible. I've done some quite technical dives, and you can never underestimate the skills that you need. She wanted to be a marine biologist, but her father multi-millionaire newspaper proprietor and businessman <laughs> who defrauded all of his uh, uh, people, members, stockholders, uh, didn't think that would be a career option for her. Instead, Captain Bob, as he was sometimes mischievously, <laughs> mischievously dubbed, wanted her to go into business. Captain Bob, huh? Mm -hmm. uh, Always harmless. <laughs> Good old Captain Bob. Let's have a look at Captain Bob here. Um, some of these pictures I find interesting because we have to remember the arc of this woman's life, uh, you know, born into some serious, serious money and connections. And um, I have a shot. Oh, there it is. This shot, I think, tells us a lot. It is Mr. Spy <laughs> and uh, Malfeasance on the Seas there. And, of course, he would call his yacht Lady Ghislaine, so she certainly was something of a favorite. Um, there's a whole story in relation to her family and the sisters and their association with Promise Software. Um, you know, these things run deep, and if you really look at the deep state game, you can come into the hot zone piece. They actually 
operate on the same level, <laughs> which is something that seems extraordinary um, at first glance. And then all of a sudden, boom, those things connect up. All right, a little more on this. The Terramar Project, which is a registered tra charity in the UK and a fully compliant nonprofit in the US, is not a campaigning organization. Rather, it's an education platform since the next couple of generations will drive the necessary change and also a web-based provider of curated content, tools for engagement, and ways to connect marine professionals with one another as well as their fellow citizens of Terramar. It's the perfect cover for exploring these ruins underwater. <laughs> There's nothing better. It's a non ocean nonprofit. You can bring in the top scientists to study this stuff. You can reanimate Atlantis. If you are uh, fully on board with the mystery schools and the secret societies who believe in this, you think that land is rising off the east coast of America and is going to be a new nation, and you will be able to found it and create the new Atlantis. So. Um, but you will be creating that connection with Belial. You'll be uh, locked in with the Belial, the reconnecting of Belial and the Atlantis cult. Um, this is where the trail leads us. And remember, the land rising piece now, coming out of the Casey readings, coming out of Steiner's work, is really solid tenet in the mystery schools. And it is something which could explain a lot about what we're seeing in relation to the hot zone, that there's land rising there, and that's going to be one of the most valuable things on the face of the earth. And probably the other place that is going to be also very important is Antarctica, which her boyfriend, husband, divorced husband, whatever this guy is, also comes into play. Well, I want to mention this guy because, you know, he's, he's quite unusual uh, for a lot of reasons. And uh, he ran a company called Cargo Metrics. He's a very interesting uh, figure. Cargo Metrics, oddly enough, was not so much a company as a hedge fund. Um, but this is the guy who had a house with Ghislaine when she had to kind of flee after the Epstein thing went down. And they were up at Manchester by the sea. Where, how far up the coast would you put that? Not from far here? at all. Not far Half at all. Half hour, maybe. Before she landed in her million dollar paid in cash house. Uh, and uh, that was in Bedford, New Hampshire. And of course, what was the name that uh, our friend here, Ghislaine Maxwell, used when she bought the house? Janet Atlantis. Janet Atlantis. Um, there are hints all over the place with Ghislaine in relation to this. And <laughs> I'm going to back that up because I have an interesting picture of the actual Janet Atlantis. All right. Um, Scott Borgerson. This is a guy um, who was cited with her and they thought, oh, that's her husband. Oh, no, it's her boyfriend. Oh, he divorced her. Oh, she signed over $20 million to him after she got put in jail because she didn't want the money to be taken up by some of these cases, potentially like the Jufre case that would come up against her. So this guy is a major player in the middle of all this, but he's tried to kind of politely get out. Uh, he has an unusual background and uh, he has... Uh, you know, a history of violence, and he his wife had a restraining order against him. Um, but he moved on through business and different things. But this guy was also a CFR fellow resident. It's Council on Foreign Relations in 2008. It's pretty extreme um, connections there. I want to grab something he said off the record, uh, on the record, but sort of off the cuff, shall we say. In 2013, he was being interviewed and he's talking about this concept of cargo metrics. Cargo metrics, by the way, is a hedge fund, which is a way to bet on shipping lanes. Um, so it's, it's portrayed a little bit differently. This guy wanted to be the head of this. And um, so he's talking and this guy's asking him questions and uh, He's saying, as for the U.S., its relative indifference can surprisingly be traced to its impotence, primarily because it has only one icebreaker, and isn't, even that isn't prepared for Arctic missions. 
And then uh, the guy writing the article who's asking the question says, despite this, Borgeson argues that the U.S. is best placed to lead a multilateral solution and perhaps to avoid armed conflict. Because the Arctic has hitherto been frozen, there is no agreement as to which rules should apply there. Notice the connection, just like the land rising in the Atlantic. He's saying the same thing is true over there. Here's the key point. Quote, ready? Borgeson. Member. Ghislaine's husband, boyfriend, whatever you want to call him. Here's his quote. It's as if the island of Atlantis, treasure intact, suddenly emerged from the depths of the existing institutions that deal with the issue. The Arctic Council is prevented by the U.S. from addressing security concerns. Let's try it again. It's as if the island of Atlantis, treasure intact, suddenly emerged from the depths. That's Borgerson. Is this the kind of thing that you kind of roll out there in a conversation? That's part of the thinking process. He knows all about Atlantis. He knows about the search for Atlantis because that's what his wife, girlfriend, uh, ex-wife is all about. Here he is on the record speaking about the Arctic, which is a big obsession for him. Borgeson argues that the U.S. is best placed to lead a multilateral solution and perhaps to avoid armed conflict. Because the Arctic has hitherto been frozen, there's no agreement as to which rules should apply there. That's how we should think about the hot zone. There's no rules as to which rules should apply there if land rises. That's the cutout of what they're working on. His quote, it's as if the island of Atlantis, treasure intact, suddenly emerged from the depths. So um, we have him on record talking about Atlantis it rising, suddenly intact. There's uh, an article that was co-written with somebody else from earlier, from 2008, about the age of the Arctic. And that quote's a little less dramatic, but it also gets us into this area. Well, at the top of our world sits the polar sea. At its bottom lies the ice-covered continent of Antarctica. As its ice cover melts, this long isolated continent will rise from the shadows like Atlantis, transmigrating from imagination to reality. <laughs> um, now, that's co-written with somebody else. So that quote, maybe it was the other person who had it. But here we have this strange indication, again, of Atlantis and Antarctica being similar because there's no rules that apply. So um, Borgerson here is indicating because the Arctic's been frozen, there's no agreement as to which rules should supply. That's in The Guardian. Um, so... His knowledge base, you know, or at least his metaphors are, are quite unusual considering his wife there is buying houses under the name Janet Atlantis. Um, Janet Marshall Atlantis. <laughs> These two are very interesting. Uh, and I think it's a deep piece that gets us with Maxwell in the hot zone. Let's uh, just a couple of quick facts about their relationship. By the time Ghislaine Maxwell was fighting allegations that she had procured underage women to provide sexual services for ex-boyfriend Jeffrey Epstein, there was a new man in her life. His name is Scott Burgesson. Miss Maxwell, according to her friend Christopher Mason, described him sometime around 2015 as a Navy SEAL, though he actually is a former Coast Guard officer. Um, <laughs> it didn't exactly surprise Mr. Mason or others she described Mr. Burgesson in the same way. When this fact came to light, Ms. Maxwell had always been known among her friends as a person with a singular ability to mythologize her own reality. I thought that was very interesting. Ms. Maxwell had in 2012 founded and appointed herself CEO of the Terramar Project, an opaque organization that had no offices and gave no grants to other organizations. It was disbanded in 2019. By the way, it had a uh, post office box uh, address in Walpole which uh, is not too far outside of Boston. Um, so we've got some very, there's some depth here, which I'm going to save for part two on Burgesson. But um, one of the things that I think is interesting in the New York Times is Burgesson was called a director of the Terramar Project. So he's deeply involved with Ghislaine, not just personally, but as far as Terramar goes. Uh, Ms. Maxwell supplied him and Cargo Metrics with introductions to people on her contacts list. I thought that was significant. Um, 
In 2007, he became a fellow in residence at the Council on Foreign Relations. Of course, that's uh, David Rockefeller and, and all the rest. So um, we've got a real deep player there with him, and he hooks up with her after she gets into trouble. And he kind of uses, he's right here in Boston. He uses his ability to kind of navigate her <laughs> around the New England landscape. And um, Mrs. Mr. Borgerson's were among uh, the most prominent. That's what led to his involvement in the Arctic Circle. Back when Mr. Borgerson was writing for Foreign Affairs, there weren't a lot of articles being published about oceanic conservation. The CEO of the Arctic Circle, Dagenfer Swanson, an organization dedicated to economic and environmental issues in the region. Mr. Borgerson was picked to serve on its advisory board to moderate a discussion about business in the Arctic. And then uh, he also has a piece where he goes into how uh, magical the Antarctic uh, Antarctica is. So uh, we've got somebody who's a really kind of deep player um, running a hedge fund about cargo metrics that he says wants to be the NSA of the seas. <laughs> Imagine aspiring to have the NSA of the seas, another deep intelligence operator inside this operation. So what are we looking at? We're looking at deep state operators at the core trying to find ancient ruins. They have some purpose, some cause to be the first ones there. This game has been going on at least since T.T. Brown there in Cuba in 1930, but certainly since Casey gave readings on it that disappeared. Um, and that history takes us through high-end figures like Hemingway. It takes us into a national security incident in 1962 with JFK trying to get something out of Hemingway's villa. Um, it takes us through these strange waves of David Zink working with Cousteau trying to find Atlantis there in the hot zone. And Cousteau, that generational family, the granddaughter being into ocean preservation, well, that was Maxwell's game. And instead, what happens is that name comes tumbling out in these court documents that Jufre brings forward and gives us that hint that it was Epstein who wanted the information on Atlantis direct from a family source that Cousteau had in the hot zone, which is where he did a six-part series on Atlantis. These things are unmistakable. So the question is, where in their process, now that Epstein's dead and Maxwell's in prison, where is that trail of what they were doing in the hot zone? Who has taken up the reins of what mm. they were up to. That is where we're going to spotlight. We're going to jump to that in the next episode. But in the meantime, Miss Olivia, you're up. Okay, David Tormina, DJ, Epstein doesn't seem to fit into an ex-protect or ex-share category. Where do you place him? And Wendy Eater says, Epstein was clearly the front man, but who is the real power behind him? Oh, yeah. Well, they're excellent questions. This is a deep operator. You have to think... Um, Think about Jack Ruby for a moment. Jack Ruby was a strip club operator and he had run, been a gun runner to Cuba, but he was portrayed publicly and by the Warren Commission as just this kind of gruff, you know, uh, guy. By the way, he never had any, there's, there's no, uh, there's nothing about him and the strippers. And you'll find this about a lot of, the figures in the Kennedy assassination is they seem almost kind of sexless. Uh, even J. Edgar Hoover has a weird piece in this. I know that they were like, well, he dresses up in women's clothing and his, his lover was Tolson, but um, nonetheless, he also has this, you know, Clay Shaw kind of aspect to him. Whatever um, cult or secret society they belong to, it seems to be all about, men. Now, Ruby is an interesting way for us to look into this because, in fact, Ruby, it was discovered later, not widely publicized, had worked for the government in closed-door sessions and had been basically a snitch in Chicago. Um, but he had also 
been visiting high-level uh, mafia figures in Cuba and transporting messages back and forth between Cuba, Florida, and Texas and New Orleans. And then he was also part of the Carlos Marcello piece. So um, on the surface, we've got a strip club owner and right, he kills a presidential assassin, right? <laughs> Who wasn't really an assassin. So think about Epstein and the way he's publicly portrayed. We understand some things about it, but it's strange. If he was such a master of blackmail and everything else, why would these people hang around with him? So if I'm President Clinton, I don't want to get caught in another trap. I've been caught in so many traps. Why am I going to have this guy around to put me in another one? There has to be some fundamental agreement and understanding that he has with Hawking or Bill Gates or Clinton that allows him to be absolutely trusted. But remember, one of the people who got rid of him was Trump. And it's there's a story on the record that he was there at Mar-a-Lago and he was uh, attempting to romance an underage girl there. And that Trump, sensing problems or trouble or blackmail, booted him and didn't see him again. And whenever they run the stories about Epstein, they'll always show that Trump picture. But, you know, you have the 23 missions of the Lolita Express for Clinton and all that stuff. They always try to put that out there and mix it up, jumble it up. But in fact, he worked with a very defined network, although he spread himself out dramatically. Interestingly enough, um, on the Trump side, they try to press him during a press conference. What about Ghislaine Maxwell? And he was basically like, good luck. So there's a lot of strange things there, but I think if you're going to get to um, who's behind Epstein, you might want to think of the um, one of the people who launched Epstein, who was the uh, dad of the Attorney General Barr. Barr is such an important figure because he has the auspicious uh, the title of being George Bush's lawyer when he was the CIA director. So Barr was a very heavy duty deep state operator. And the fact that he got installed as Trump's attorney general is kind of unbelievable. And I've seen this with Trump before, um, where he's, he can like Pompeo, um, he can receive kind of the, the wrong people at the wrong time. Gina Haspel, for example, um, and Bill O'Reilly, you know, putting in his ear, oh, hey, you know, the thing that you should pump up is the vaccine, things like that. You know, there's that kind of triangle of influence around Trump where he's sort of one foot in, one foot out. But um, certainly I think Barr is maybe a place to look in relation to that. I think it is the knowledge of Atlantis and the hot zone and Epstein's attempt you know, this has largely been about Maxwell, but there's a whole thing at the Zorro Ranch, which is all that imagery, and at St. James Island, all that Atlantis imagery. So, um, you know, it's there. It's thick. And we covered it in the, the X100, but I, you know, there's no question that um, this, I think, is where we can get a better angle. Yes. Catherine Harris says, William Barr's father wrote this utterly bats book about aliens replete with torture and sex abuse. <laughs> That's true. I know. How are we going to explain that one? So um, Reason 8432 says, Joe Biden owns an island next to Epstein's Island. It has an old submarine base. Connect that dot. His brother does. His brother does. And it is very unusual. Um Branson's down there. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of figures are there in the hot zone. I think most of the major decisions take place in the hot zone. One of the things, of course, you know, we know Hemingway was in the hot zone, but what about Nixon in in Bimini? Nixon spent all this time in Bimini. Martin Luther King wrote the "I Have a Dream" speech in Bimini. What is it about Bimini exactly? And that group that's on the inside knows or people around that circle have heard that's why bimini has such an important place in all this um the underwater ruins and i think that mastery of the underwater seas is very tricky because you're dealing with individual governments so if i want to go down there and really find what's under bimini i might be dealing with 
the British government. I might be dealing with the Coast Guard. You know, I, there's so many things and complications around it. They can make it so that even that stuff is in plain sight, we can't get our hands on it. I've talked very often on this program about stealth archives. Right now, there's a letter in the LBJ library called the X letter, and it's not to be opened until 2023. Um, and they'll probably put it off there. But that X letter is something that LBJ wanted to get out to the world. And everyone assumed, oh, it's all salacious stuff about Richard Nixon. But he might have also been saying, oh, you know, this is when UFO disclosure takes place. I want my role in it put up there. Um, there's a number of, of things like that. There are tapes that Jackie Kennedy and Robert Kennedy gave right after the assassination, which aren't to be released until um, 75 years after they gave them. So basically the year 2039. But we know that they're there. So stealth archives are very important for us to navigate uh, this, just like the Atlantans, uh, the Atlantean ruins off of Bimini. We know that they're there, but how do you get at them? <laughs> I mean, National Geographic's not going to tell you the truth in relation to it. They have a whole kind of protection thing about the story that they want out there. Why did they work with Zahi Hawass for so, so many years, who had so many different people complaining about him. Uh, you know, this guy had a terrible reputation and they try to make him everything about him was, hey, look, he's Indiana Jones, you know? Um, so well, you know. he's profiled, right? You get somebody who's pretty mediocre, right? But a terrible narcissist and you promote those people. And that, yes. that is the formula for success, right? I remember when Graham Hancock called him out and you know, he just flipped out. He, he just lost it. <laughs> and he had done so many things to keep Graham Hancock, Baval, and Robert Schock off of the Giza Plateau. Why? Because they were finding out, oh, guess what? You know, that's rain weathering on the Sphinx. That means the Sphinx goes back to when Egypt had rain. When's that? Oh, it's around 10,000 BC. Oh, that moves civilization back <laughs> about 5,000 years. You know, these are major things. And then He's hanging around there thinking to himself, oh, I can't let that out. And then what happens when there's a big coup there uh, in Egypt, just before the big coup in 2011, they make him part of the government. He's a cabinet position in the corrupt Mubarak government. I mean, you know, the Hall of Records piece is, is major, and it has to be figured in with the geopolitical you know, when we're adding these things up. Yes. Do you want to mention that um, prophecy about the three people who would open the Hall of Records in Egypt? Yeah. Um, that is interesting. Well, Casey's talked about how, you know, you, you can't just find the records in Egypt and go in. <laughs> uh, he's talked about a kind of esoteric process that would take place and a kind of protection around it. So he said that eventually the three individuals who would bring open the Egyptian Hall of Records. Remember, there are three sets. There's the Egyptian Hall of Records, there's the Poseidon ones off Bimini, and then there's the ones by Iltar in Yucatan. The Yucatan um, piece may be Guatemala, interestingly enough, because Yucatan was called to represent the whole area, and some of the KC investigators over the years have found very compelling things that match his descriptions that are in Guatemala. Um, but the Poseidon temple is related to the Bimini wall. So we have those pieces there. Um, the Egyptian piece, one of the people who was supposed to bring it up would be British. That's one of the things that he said. And it made me think uh, of Graham Hancock. And certainly he's somebody who spent a tremendous amount of time there. Um, I wanted to follow up on this thing. Just a quick thing to put in about Ghislaine. Ghislaine Maxwell posed as journalist called Janet Marshall to buy a luxury hideout. <laughs> That's the Janet Atlantis piece. Ready? Um, this is the feminist, and uh, she's written all these influential books. Janet Atlantis Marshall, who wrote as Janet Atlantis. And... There's the Janet Atlantis, Janet Marshall. Um, Ghislaine using that name signaling again. Um, and the other piece, one other piece here. 
This is the book published by our friend Robert Maxwell. And it's all about the ocean floor and its perturbations to the Gulf Stream by Atlantis II. The Gulf Stream, of course, right there uh, in the hot zone. And that series of books by Pergamon Press, which was the press that got Robert Maxwell into uh, all of these different areas of life that he could then exploit with his spy work and also develop that incredible fortune that he would then defraud the uh, various stockholders in the company. Yes. So William Ledger, was Terramar ever a topic at Davos? Hmm. She spoke at the UN. Um, you know, so she's had those high end uh, pieces. And I wonder with Davos, uh, it's possible. I'll look into that. I'll look into whether it made it there. She certainly had a series of um, high level speaking engagements. And if you look at the articles, they're so like <laughs> blowing sugar at her. It's unbelievable. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't believe it. This woman really had the press in the palm of her hand through the influence of Epstein. There's no question about it. Even after Epstein had his earlier problems, because you remember with Epstein, there were two waves of him getting into trouble. There's a wave in 2008 where all this stuff comes out and then it all comes back. So the first time he got off, you know, very lightly, and uh, but all the stuff came back somehow the second time around. And of course, it was under Barr, uh, the attorney general, that this killing of Epstein happened. You know, there's no way that could have been a suicide. It's absurd. Um, and there's a lot of people who think that Maxwell was uh, that Epstein was just hustled away. You know, it's like they faked his death and that's that. I don't know. I mean, this guy was a walking time bomb. I don't know if you'd want that information out there, but certainly the absurdity that Barr could stare the American public straight in the face. This is the most high profile prisoner in the entire country and your cameras are going to fail and you're also going to drop the guard on him. It's ridiculous, right? The fact that we even, you know, why should we be surprised that there was a, a fake election and all the fraud that took place in relation to that? Why should we be surprised that we got Stepford Biden? And why should we be surprised that Fauci is a liar? I mean, these are the things, you know, we've been taking the barefaced lies and everybody knew. And if, you know, only an idiot <laughs> would think that Epstein killed himself. It's ridiculous. You know, he was somebody who was under guard, under suicide watch, and they removed it. And then they also made the cameras fail. It reminds me of when Oswald was supposed to have gone to Mexico City. Mm -hmm. And he goes in there and he says, I, you know, I want to go to the Soviet Union. Uh, this is after he already went there and came back. Supposedly, this guy goes in there and he acts like a maniac. And he's like, I have to see the consulate. And, you know, um, then the CIA says, oh, you know, the day he came, the cameras broke. We don't. We were trying to fix our cameras. <laughs> you know, I mean, what, what kind of junk is uh, are we supposed to accept on that? It's ridiculous. You know, Oswald was never at the Mexico City Embassy, <laughs> by the way. Um, everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show. We are here with X Series 118, taking your questions. I have a couple more things to put on the record before we do a part two on this one. What do you got? Oh, I got some big stuff. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, Wendy Eater, uh, what is behind the obsession with bloodlines? And Luke Wapper says, do Ghislaine and Epstein only want girls with RH negative blood? There's more. Go ahead. But, okay. Michael Snow, thoughts on Zorro Ranch being used to clone prominent bloodlines to insert them in positions of power unbeknownst to them, then becoming power players to be manipulated as necessary? And Twilight Excellent. says, do you think that along with all the Madam work for their cult, they were also harvesting DNA for clones and following in the Atlantean heritage for messing with genetics? Yes. Well, there's a, a genetic component on record with his support of eugenics uh, from an office over here at Harvard. And I'll think of the name of the office. Uh, but he was supporting them. We know that he was he had talked behind the scenes about impregnating all these girls with his super genes and all that. So this is a major fixation of his. Um, but um, one of the things I want to get to when we talk about um, bloodlines and things of this nature, 
you know, we have to remember that um, their entire piece runs on bloodlines and that there is a ancient bloodline connection when you go into secret side societies or mystery schools. Um, and so they very much believe in that and they try to keep it under the radar. Uh, there's somebody who did an incredible survey of presidents and found that most of the presidents were related in America. Um, I don't, it's not by accident. Um, you know, so the bloodline aspect is related to a very ancient esoteric piece. And um, the, what we think about as like Pharaoh and things of this nature, um, they used to assume that Pharaoh was godlike. And so one of the reasons they adopted this idea of marrying within the family was you had to, you couldn't let the God just procreate with a human being. He have to, you know, do it inside of his own bloodline. So um, this is a very old esoteric piece that they have kept into, you know, think of uh, the obsession that the Nazis had with pure blood and things of this nature. Um, it also harkens back to something in Atlantis where, and this is part of the Amelia story that Casey tells, where these um, souls had projected themselves, but uh, they were contaminated with animal matter in that projection. And that part of Amelius's mission uh, and Rata's mission in the Casey cosmology is he brings them out of that lower state that they became entrapped in. So, um, and there's a story there, there's, you know, they call it in the ancient Hebrew uh, texts, the Elohim, and they are the higher watchers and the higher watchers uh, sleep with the daughters of men and produce giants. And those giants are very warlike. So we have these stories, these echoes that there was another branch, like a spiritual uh, Superman type thing. And that these beings interacted with regular humanity and produced these uh, offspring. So what we have are echoes through all of these different things. Now, um, you know, they're using the same thing in relation to uh, the injections, for example. They're saying, oh, you know, they're using it like a purity cult. And I've talked about this before. There's one version of the Planet of the Apes movies. I'm trying to think of which one it is, where they worship the atomic bomb. I think it's the second. I think it's the second one, too. It's the second one. And what he finds at the end of the movie is that they're worshiping the actual bomb in a, in a cave somewhere. And this is the thing that's going on uh, with how they're treating the, uh, you know, the, this whole medical emergency and the thing that they've been pushing out in relation to COVID. They're putting it in that, you know, worshiping uh, the solution idea. And of course, only giving you one solution. So they they're tampering again with that sense of, purity uh, fixation, which is a natural uh, spiritual elevation. There's spiritual purity. They're not getting at anything like that. And the, as a matter of fact, they don't want you to be a better, healthier human being at all. They just want you to take the holy sacrament of mm. uh, Gates and Fauci. So it's very, um, we see a lot of these strains through our everyday lives, especially with the emergencies, because the emergencies, where they go when they operate with emergencies um, shows us a lot about how they think because they think we can not, you know, there's something that Hillary said out loud once, which is remarkable. She said, never let an emergency go to waste, never let a crisis go to waste. Um, it reveals a lot about them. Remember that uh, the enabling act with Hitler was all due to the Reichstag fire, which is a clear uh, false flag where the Nazis uh, bombed their own uh, state building in order to say, oh, the communists are after us. We need to give Hitler all the power. That is a trick that's been used over and over again. And here we are in the middle of them using it. Trust me, uh, they'll use it for a COG thing. One of the things that's going on in relation to this Russia thing is they could get us involved in a nuclear exchange of some kind. And can you imagine these people in charge of any kind of response? They'd be like, stay in your house in a plastic outfit and we'll throw you Amazon treats through the window like we do to the people in Australia now. Um, you know, these are these are some of the lowest um, 
people, and I include um, the leader of uh, New Zealand um, and uh, Canada, Trudeau. You know, they, they've just shown really incredibly sick qualities, and uh, they should be called out as a result of it. And I say it on every show that Australia is an international crisis and should be solved by all the nations of the world to get them out of that fascist grip. Yes. Uh, Sarah Bella Gignac. Um, so his will was written to have his head cryogenically preserved and his penis with uh, also, I guess, cryogenically preserved. Barr was with him 24 hours before his death. Interesting. That's quite fascinating. Uh, whenever we've touched on the cryogenics piece, it opens up incredible, strange avenues. <laughs> and we did a show on Ted Williams. And I'll tell you, whenever we get around baseball, for some reason, things <laughs> get strange around here. Okay, you're up. Okay, so Contiki Man, regarding bloodlines, is anyone keeping track of the rise or decline of alien abduction since the vax started? Um, whatever mm. is behind this must be puzzled or not. But, you know, I actually was thinking about it. Abductions sort of declined long time ago during the um, well after the 1986 um, vaccination. The what do they call it? That Reagan passed. Oh, you think so? Well, well I think so. Yeah. yeah, they sort of slow down, right? As I think that the culture around it was interesting because by the 90s it exploded, right? But it was almost like these things are so common we can talk about them now. And it was always the grays, right? The, the, all the other alien types went out the window in the 90s. It was all the bubble-headed grays, uh, which is also an interesting piece. The point is, those were children. Those were, it was the children's schedule, the vaccine schedule. They would, um, so you would still be able to abduct adults or young adults who were already, af you know. I think what's for sure is that the, um, the vaccine piece yeah, has a very strange history and it seems to kind of come up dramatically and then back off. I remember all these things that were coming up in relation to measles. Um, and suddenly, you know, me measles was the most dangerous thing in the world. It's like just before all this stuff hit and suddenly they were all talking about measles, but the abduction phenomena, um, and I know what you're talking about in relation to this, it seems to have cycles because if you look at the 1960s and the 1970s, there's dramatic cases. Um, you know, there's Betty and Barney Hill. There's, uh, you know, Pascagoula. They're just the like foundational cases uh, in terms of contact. And by the time you get to John Mack and all those people that he's working through their alien experiences, alien regression therapy, you know, or, or regression therapy about alien abdu abductions um, was common. <laughs> And I would say it's something we've talked about before, which is the event of 9-11, mm -hmm. right? And what does 9-11 do? It puts us in. Well, like, it lowers our frequency. Yeah. Right. To a state of constant it, fear. It puts us in a weird fear environment. Um, so I think that is a kind of a roundabout way of answering that, which is um, what they're planning I would say this to round out that piece. What they're planning in relation to alien abduction and UFO threat and thing like that, the operation itself is the ultimate emergency. And so they feel like they can revoke the constitutional rights and just implement the ultimate emergency powers, which is exactly, you know, this is how these people think. Um, so that's where they're heading. And I'm sure that Epstein thought he was going to build some Atlantean utopia. Now, here's an interesting thing in relation to Zorro Ranch. Okay. There is a movie, which we know very well, called Lolita. Uh, I've pointed out that a lot of the imagery in that movie and the background of that movie uh, is in an episode I have called Female Targets, the second one. In that movie, when he's going at the end of the movie, James Mason, the character who's obsessed with her all this time, meets her when she's with this guy and she's pregnant and everything. He said, what happened to you? You disappeared. And oh, she right. disappears with this Peter Sellers character who is a playwright and it's all around Hollywood and all that. And where is it that he's taken her to? New Mexico. Into a ranch. Mm -hmm. And all the people sound like the cronies of Epstein types. Mm -hmm. 
these kind of right. They're gonna make dirty movies. Right. Mm -hmm. They're gonna make porn movies. Uh, there's po political figures. There's artists. All the rest of it. So um, I found that interesting in that they identified New Mexico. Was this a lineage, this Zorro Ranch? That's something I think that should be figured out in relation to that. And of course, in the X series, we're always putting new geography on the map. New Mexico, you're very well known for Roswell. But what about the Lolita Zorro connection? <laughs> That's the one. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show. We are here in episode 118 of the X series going deep on Ghislaine Maxwell and the craze in the Atlantis hot zone. We're going to be taking some more of your questions and I have a few more things to put on the record, uh, although I'll save the rest of the dramatic stuff. Well, some of this is still dramatic, but I'll save... Uh, there's a part two on this that's going to really be another mind blower. Yes. Kathy Pfizer, isn't it Maxwell's sister who runs 23andMe? Yeah, you know, she's involved. Um, and what's really interesting, of course, is uh, the family involvement in software, I think. And that really opens up a whole different uh, avenue, a whole vista of what these people were about. But remember the thing about Promise Software is that it operated, it, it, there was a huge spy aspect involved with it, that it had a back door that all the intelligence agencies knew about, but the US government stole this uh, promised technology and they gave it away or sold it to their supposed allies and spied on them through the software. Um, there's a piece here that's connected because remember there's a UFO file connection to promise software through the figure of Michael Reconosciuto because um, Reconosciuto's dad was the uh, partner of Fred Christman. And the whole Maury Island incident, that whole piece is foundational to the UFO file story. And there we have Reconosciuto right in the middle of it. Yes. World Change Brief, there were some Pizzagate photos of children in ceremonial garb that was um, that was not satanic, possibly an Atlantean-style ritual. Is there an Atlantis connection to Epstein's Island Temple? No question. I mean, have you ever, if you look at the <laughs> temple, for sure, even the figures on it are directly referenced to the Plato Atlantis story. Um, yeah, I don't think that, um, see, for me, the uh, the Belial piece is harmonic. It's the, So when Casey says Belial, Steiner's using harmonic, they're the same thing. And they think that they are um, super elite from Atlantis. They think that they have a strain of this DNA. They think... Um, what we can see, we don't know all of what they're thinking, but a piece maybe of what they're thinking is that if they can be the ones there to open that temple, if they can reconnect to this force, to this entity. You know, um, in my work with Gigi Young, I have explored this question through uh, Gigi's ability to tune in psychically. And just to kind of round out the idea, um, it seems as though they are desperately seeking this connection uh, that it's kind of like the culmination of all their efforts to uh, control the spiritual life of humanity. This is what they're trying to do. And so the cult of Atlantis is a crucial piece to how they accomplish this, yes. I, this is kind of a far out question. Karen Carpenter, is Zora Ranch, Lolita, and Area 51 connected? <laughs> well, it's interesting. Um, why always look at geography? Always. It, it explains, it opens up a lot, actually. The hot zone geography opens up a lot right off the bat. Bimini, Cuba, Yucatan. Yucatan has the ruins but it has the Hall of Records. There's two Hall of Records, uh, according to Casey, between Yucatan and Bimini. There's two, and then the other one's in Egypt, right? So it's kind of a good area if you're looking for these uh, this ancient material. Why do you want the Hall of Records if you are a deep state person? Well, there's a lot of reasons. Uh, 
that whole story of humanity is in it. The power, you remember, of course, the stories of Hitler looking for the spear of destiny and understanding the power of the archaeology wars, you know, why the Baghdad Museum was looted in the first place. And I've had episodes with Dr. Farrell about that. Um, so, you know, when we look at this, we understand things from a different point of view and what's happening there. Um, so now let's go back and take it back to Bimini. If there is a temple of Poseidon arising there, then it represents an incredible uh, awakening. And those people want to be in the heart of it. But the Hall of Records contains information about the two-eye stone and its construction. And that information, I can tell you, is something that's been sought after um, and has caused huge geopolitical problems in that area, the Hatsa. That's where the research leads us. Yes. Um, Syrianification says Zoro Ranch is much closer to Dulce. Oh, and wow. I don't know about you, but I, Dulce, just even the name creeps me out. Well, the creepy story about Dulce, of course, comes directly from Phil Schneider. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, look, you don't have to believe everything that Phil Schneider put out there before he was killed. But uh, he was only around for a little bit, you know, a little while, really, a couple of months out talking. You know, it wasn't like this guy had years and years, like a Gaia whistleblower or something like that. So uh, what did he put on the record exactly? Well, he put on the record that he was working at tunneling out very, very deep underground caverns. Uh, and we know there's a massive underground setup that the government has, and that's part of the continuity of government operation. But it is also an underground government. And he said while they were doing some of this, he and a Green Beret stumbled into one of these mountains and there were a series of aliens in there and they were doing, they had their own labs and their own work. And uh, they were so freaked out at each other that they, they shot at each other and that the Green Beret saved his life. I mean, it is a really far out story. But fundamentally, what he was saying was there are aliens working with our government underground. So that's the thing you take or leave in relation to Schneider's comment. And so the Dulce story is absolutely fascinating. And um, there are other stories from Native Americans in relation to Dulce because there's a Native, uh, serious Native American presence there. So uh, no, I think there's something to it. I absolutely do. Yeah. You talk to any indig indigenous group and they all say, you know, there's yes underground, uh, the you know bases and um and they're you have, i mean they're, they have no problem you know the star beings it's just part of their right understanding of the exactly universe. kachina <laughs> so uh, let's pivot okay so um roster on the seer ernest hemingway suicide or murder um the night before he supposedly committed suicide he was driving a friend around and showing them a car, like a men in black type car with two government types in it saying, they've been following me. Um, I think since, you know, there's tons of FBI documents in relation to Hemingway. Since he had come back from Cuba, they were very curious about him because when he was in Cuba, he formed his own intelligence unit. I've posited that he was also part of the Caroline group, Intel group. And I, I've put in some pretty major figures like JFK in that group, but the JFK Hemingway connection is unmistakable. The JFK Casey connection is, is even, I mean, uh, the, I'm sorry, the um, Hemingway Casey connection is on the record. The JFK one is a little more tenuous. And yet, if you really put the threads together, there's a letter to Hemingway that was left JFK's dorm, which sounds a little bit friendly to be like, you know, hey, <laughs> uh, I don't know you, but you know, it's not one of those. It's asking him kind of direct questions. And then in the 50s, as a senator, he writes him a letter. And then he invites him to the inauguration. And then Hemingway gives these incredible speeches about him. And then after he dies, Mary Hemingway goes and hatches the whole plan with Kennedy to get 
um, whatever it is that was in that vault out of Cuba. And there's a conversation that would risk a national security incident on record with JFK, his CIA director, Robert Kennedy, and Edward Lansdale. So those threads are there. They, they have, um, you know, those connections are there. Hemingway's brother, Les, he kills himself the same way. Margot Hemingway, uh, Hemingway's granddaughter, she dies the same way. And her dad is a CIA agent, Jack Hemingway, who what? Ernest Hemingway is afraid of. <laughs> Imagine being afraid of your own son as a CIA agent. So that family, there's a very strange thread through that family. And of course, even from the very beginning, you know, his dad, Ernest's dad, is going along, seems like a very happy life, and then kills himself. So there's a, there's a thread with the Hemingways of suicide, for sure. But how many of those are engineered? And this family seems very close to, um, you know, not only the incredible public profile and output, how many people has Ernest influenced just with this incredible genius? But there's something else uh, in relation to the family. And uh, I think Marielle has talked about it as well in her documentary, Running From Crazy. There's some piece and, you know, it doesn't come out. And then I've mentioned on this program, Hillary Hemingway, who was um, Lester's daughter. And he took her around looking for Atlantis. They went to the uh, Bimini Healing Well. You know, there's videotape of them from the 70s doing that. And in the 90s, what does she turn around and do? She writes books about UFO abduction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's a lot. There's a lot with the Hemingways and, uh, you know, I think the thing that we've brought forward about them has never surfaced before we did it. So that I think the ramifications and the ripples of that information through the family and the people that they know uh, is, is going to cause more things to open up. <laughs> okay. Scruples 4444. Yes. What is DJ's take on perhaps John McAfee's was suicided due to his ties to the Bimini hot zone, mineral mining, et cetera, high probability for gold? Well, I'll tell you, um, the McAfee thing is sad, no matter how you slice it. And um, he was not a guy who seemed like he would commit suicide under any conditions. No way. And on the record, I think he went out of his way to point that out. And, you know, his wife thinks that as well. Um, I can say this about McAfee, the fact that he was in the hot zone and the way that he was acting, um, I mean, he certainly was somebody who had incredible um, <laughs> risks involved with the things that he knew. There's no question about it. And uh, I think that they wanted to take him down for a lot of reasons because he was somebody who with his information and with his knowledge of technology and stuff, he was somebody who you didn't want out there. Um, so I think that they silenced him. And unfortunately, this is the way it went. I do think that his presence in the hot zone um, was remarkable. And the fact that he went to Hemingway's house um, before he got arrested and all the rest is, is very interesting. So if you were to say to me, John McAfee was taken out. I would agree with you 100%. Yes. David Tormina. DJ, what about this group of ex-NASA people talking about colonies living underwater? Mm. Has Ghislaine Maxwell been in contact with Dennis Chamberlain's Atlantica expeditions? Right. Well, this is interesting. Whenever you find conversations about the oceans, NASA's right in the heart of it. If you go into the hot zone, NASA's there. <laughs> you've got the Space Coast and you've got Rubio you know, with all this talk about UAP and, oh, the UFO threat and all that stuff, he's the senator from the Space Coast. <laughs> You've got Trump and Mar-a-Lago. I mean, the whole thing is is there, seemingly. Um, so you're going to find those connections and the conditions, you know, if like you go through C-Lab, for example, and we try to do a sort of a mini profile on them in a previous episode, 
but fundamentally, you know, what they were doing, they were using astronauts to um, utilize those same skills that they used in space to use underwater. And it's unusual because the conditions that they put them in, um, you know, helium and all the rest of it, um, cause basically an altered state when they reach a certain level in the water. So um, I believe that part of this combination of NASA and the ocean relates to magnetism. And the reason that we have launches um, out there in Florida for the shuttle and everything else, I believe relates directly to those magnetic currents. So, uh, but in terms of the groups getting together and uh, the archeology span groups being associated with the space groups, absolutely, <laughs> go for it. Uh, Brian Kinney, where does James Cameron fit into the underwater archeology span paradigm? I would venture to guess he has every means of confirming underwater anomalies. Well, he, yes, there's no question about it. And he went around the world. He's another one with the sinkholes and the studying these massive um, pieces of what's going on underwater. There, uh, as we mentioned in the work of Graham Hancock, he did a whole book on underwater. There's a whole world under there that's not explored that we don't understand. They put so much emphasis on space and we, we don't even know what's going on here. So this idea that, um, you know, there could be some entirely different thing developing underwater that we know nothing about, I think is very real. What we need to do is understand that um, on the surface, you know, we have a certain kind of reality and that there's already incredible investment underwater. There's incredible investment and knowledge under the earth. You know, we have underground uh, a history of underground silos to, you know, survive nuclear attack, all the COG buildup and, you know, all these things we hear about missing people or migrants and all this stuff. It's too much of a, a disconnect. We don't know a whole lot on the surface, frankly. And um, I think even high level politicians don't know a whole lot about what's going on. One of the reasons why Antarctica and, you know, uh, the hot zone are on this very interesting level for us. And one of the reasons I favor real investigation in the hot zone is Antarctica, for as many fantastic things as are going on there, we can study the history of it. John Warner uh, the fourth was nice enough to tell us about Senator Warner and his activities there uh, that were largely hidden up around Antarctica and its development as for whatever they were doing there, militarily and all the rest. But um, what we need to kind of look at is the hot zone, you know, has all these restrictions around it. Like I was talking about with stealth archives. Like if you went to go do a full fledged thing off Bimini, you might be dealing with the Coast Guard. You might be dealing, um, you know, with the DEA. You might be dealing with all these different things in terms of getting permits and how would you do it? So it's easy to discourage somebody. However, the hot zone is accessible to a level that Antarctica is not. So I throw my effort towards the great discoveries we can make in that hot zone corridor. Why are people made to sign non-disclosure agreements when they're down there if they see ruins? There must be something incredible there. And we have hints of it through Zelitsky's work, through Casey's work, through the things we've been told about it. Um, and I think it's going to be very significant when that land rises. So, um, therefore my emphasis, you know, I keep an eye on the Antarctica thing and I'd like to find ways of getting more information about it. Um, and there are ways and means, but the hot zone is way more accessible, <laughs> even with all of the restrictions I mentioned. Yes. Uh, Esoteric 369 wall wants to know, might the two eye stone be the same material for the pyramid capstones? Hmm. Capstones are quartz, aren't they? Well, it's interesting. Um, one of the things that Casey said in relation to the capstones, which they're gone, you know, that's the whole point, which is we don't know what they were. But um, 
what he said is that when they put the capstone on, that's where we get the tradition of ringing the bells in church. So think about that, setting the tone. Casey talked uh, about how the pyramids were built with sound. So that capstone becomes very important in relation to uh, these types of things. Granite, which is what the Great Pyramid is made out of, is crystal. So the resonance possibilities um, that are going on there are remarkable. One of the things that um, we also need to examine closely in Casey's version about the pyramids is that even though he places them at 10,500 BC, which is 8,000 years earlier than the current model, he says that the group Rata and Hermes that went there to set up the Giza Plateau were doing archaeology <laughs> and that the thing that they found there had been underwater for thousands of years, something like 50,000 years. So the original, original Great Pyramid goes back much further than even the pyramids that they put up. So not only are we missing the piece of history of those 8,000 years from 2,500 BC, 10,500 BC, which is where Casey puts it, but also that group that put the pyramids there were doing archaeology. <laughs> so uh, the Great Pyramid Plateau, that spot where the original pyramid was, is something more like 60,000 BC. So um, therefore, the ages around these things and their importance to humanity is crucial. Remember when they were talking to Casey and they were like, hey, there's this guy out here. He claims there's all these pyramid prophecies, prophecies contained in the pyramid. Is that true? Uh, and Casey's response was, yes, there are prophecies in the pyramid. And this guy, the, the prophecies that he's claiming for it, you know, <laughs> we can't say much about those. They they're not really the thing, but the if you learn to read the language of the uh, pyramids and the prophecies in there, you could basically, you go from the Atlantean times to the present into the future. And they say, well, what kind of prophecy? Like, what's the method? You know, where do they leave hieroglyphs? What's the deal? And he says, no, it's in the type of stone that's used, the geometrical curve and the mathematics of it. That's the language that they left the predictions in. And, but he said that the predictions were so specific that they could identify individuals right down to the street name that they grew up on. So if you, if we're to take that seriously, and with all the other Casey work, you can see that I do, what does that say about the type of technology that was available to the Atlanteans becoming the early Egyptians that could predict things down to the street that historical figures would grow up on. I mean, it's quite remarkable when you think about it, uh, how much of things that we're seeing are planned out and how much are free will. It's quite interesting. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist show. Whew. Where, I'm sorry, where are those predictions logged? In the Great Pyramid. That's really interesting. Years ago, and I would love to find this um, documentary again, there was something about India. There were these famous scrolls have you ever seen this where uh, they you can actually look yourself up and all of that stuff is in there interesting um, about you and your destiny and it's, huh. it's i've only seen it once it was like on the history channel or something well I india no has the sacred records it. i mean they're on a par with egypt absolutely there's no question about it um the hall of records in yucatan and bimini also, I would imagine is on that level. You know, this is the Atlanteans who started the whole <laughs> business in the first place. Uh, but it is interesting. I want to mention this, which is, you know, we're kind of just trying to battling to get that recognition of the 10,500 BC thing. We understand what's going on there. The people who've done archaeoastronomy have done it. Uh, Hancock came to that conclusion. You know, these different people have done it. However, the history is actually much, much older. There's actually something in the Casey readings that talks about a meeting in Egypt in 10 million BC. Now, um, you know, <laughs> that's even way before the Neanderthals. So what's going on here with the timing piece? This goes back to what I was saying about the dinosaur piece with Carnegie. 
By the way, Carnegie, the Carnegie Institute had an exercise with their robots and all the people who were programming robots. And um, it was all about discovering Atlantis in 2023. And they discontinued the program this year. <laughs> Maybe it's getting too close. But I thought that was a very odd thing. They were like, you're an explorer. Here's the thing. You know, and they set up this whole scenario and they're like, you've discovered Atlantis. It's 2023. It's an advanced civilization. And, you know, it opens all this stuff up to humanity. That's Carnegie Institute again. Carnegie's fascination, besides being his workers, uh, work 60, 78 hours a week, was dinosaurs and Egyptian imagery. Why? Why was he obsessed with dinosaurs? When there was a dinosaur find, his team had to be on the spot first. He was obsessed with it. Um, Casey has a worldwide meeting eliminating the dinosaurs, 50,722 BC, but officially on the record, science has them 65 million BC. Something very unusual about adding those threads up, especially since uh, Casey indicates that the Atlanteans, in fact, were tampering with DNA, which is how they got those beasts. So um, there's a lot there. So you can imagine, <laughs> you know, the strangeness in this is that Epstein, bringing it all back to what we're talking about in the first place, Epstein gets into this position. He has the Atlantis obsession. He's obviously in some secret society that's giving him this information. He lands at the center of the world's top elite. But what is it that he's looking for besides an erotic massage? This guy is obsessed with going underwater with Maxwell and finding Atlantis. That's the big piece to figure out in all this. Yes. Uh, Najat Madri, any news about Carmen Bolter and her new documentary coming out? Oh, I'm always keeping an eye uh, in, in contact with Carmen. And uh, the minute anything comes up about that, I'll have it out. But she was working on it pretty heavily. She has some great footage. And I hope she gets it out soon. Uh, we can definitely help her when it comes out through word of mouth just to get it around. Because, you know, her original series on the pyramids was fascinating. And this one, I think, um, Dealing with Atlantis is going to be huge. This is a good question. Kat Goida, has the Egyptian Hall of Records already been moved and merged with the Vatican Library? <laughs> uh, look, the um, Hawass and Lehner were both trained by the ARE, sponsored by the ARE. Mark Lehner uh, wrote a book called Egyptian Heritage, which is hard to get. I have a copy of it, but it's all about the Casey readings. Lehner was in charge of the Giza Plateau and Hawass ruled it with an iron hand. Uh, he still gives lectures at the Casey Center, which is really bizarre because publicly he trashes Casey. Um, oh, there is no ancient anything, you know, like it's just this ancient Egyptian timeline. And, you know, whenever he finds something like a major tomb, he's like, you know, he always makes nothing out of it. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, the slaves had to put it together and all this stuff, you know. Um, <laughs> in the meantime, Casey's talking about how the uh, Egyptians used thought power to raise the stones and put them in place in the pyramid, you know. That's the technology piece that nobody can really talk about. Um, but fundamentally, here's the thing about the Hall of Records, and I said it earlier, which is Casey had mentioned that you can't get your hands on those Hall of Records without being purified. So, you know, the likes of Zahi Hawass or somebody, they may have tried, they may have taken the information from the Casey readings, they may have been drilling <laughs> under cover of night. I'm sure that they were. Uh, and I'm sure that the obsession on the deep state side to get their hands on the two eye stone, et cetera, through the Hall of Records is dramatic. But uh, it doesn't look like they would be able to actually lay their hands on the Hall of Records because 
you know, there's a thing about it, I think, that goes back to the Ark of the Covenant style. And this gets us into the cosmology thinking, but let's go there for a moment, which is there are all those instances in the Ark of the Covenant stories in the Bible where the wrong person gets their hands on it and they get fried, you know, or their whole army gets fried in certain cases when they try to steal the thing. That's, I think, the Hall of Records is very much like the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, I do think it will be discovered. In fact, I think it was at least the passageway to it. Um, but I don't think that the Vatican, you know, as much as the Vatican Library is an incredible stash that would move the culture forward dramatically that they've kept behind closed doors. And uh, that's unfortunate, but I would say that they don't have the Hall of Records. That would be my take on it. I sure hope not. Go ahead. Uh, Jimmy <laughs> Kenimer, is the Great Pyramid a book in stone? Yes. I mean, uh, but it's a living dynamic uh, instrument as well. And it's recording somehow the shifts and it's relating to the world development and what the world is going through. So um, it's not just a book, but certainly it's a book in stone. Um, I think the thing that Casey was indicating about it is there's something about pyramids. Remember those ancient cultures, that's all they built. And he talked about some of those pyramids that were, he said at the head of the Nile, which were the much older ones. And that plateau again had been dug up archeologically by the group in 10,500 BC. It was already archeology. span So there's something about pyramids fundamentally magnetically that uh, relate directly to humanity's spiritual incarnation on earth. And there's a, there's a, uh, a dynamic principle involved and it seems like it's spread out there to discover, but the ancients knew it. So it's a kind of a rediscovery on our, on our part. And so, you know, instead of rediscovering the atom bomb, <laughs> I hope we can rediscover the spiritual path through the Great Pyramids. Everyone, you've been watching the Dark Journalist Show. This is fantastic to have everyone here with us. We've gone really deep on Ghislaine and the Atlantis cult, Epstein, and uh, including the remarkable comments by Scott Borgerson, uh, Ghislaine's husband. There's a real deep aspect here, and we're going uh, on that hot zone road. Uh, we're going to get some real answers on this. And Miss Olivia, are we wrapping up? Yes. Okay. Um, Shashkila, do you think Ghislaine made a deal? And if so, what was that? Deal? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think she has dramatic uh, information. And I think that, um, I think her information could pull down so many government figures that, you know, um, right now she's hotter than the atomic bomb. But, I want to say this in relation to her case. I think she's in a very tenuous position. And uh, I think that uh, they could very easily say, you know what happened with Jeffrey. <laughs> uh, it's going to happen to you too. So, um, you know, I hope real answers come out in relation to what's gone on there. And I hope that um, she doesn't, you know, get sort of Oswalded and, uh, you know, I, I hope that they don't take her out of the picture in relation to this, because I think she's a crucial link in the middle of it all. Um, also, Robert Maxwell and Maxwell's family, that whole piece needs real public examination, and we need people to come forward in relation to them and who they are and what they're up to. Of course, uh, Robert Maxwell was buried in Israel with all honors because they knew the kind of incredible uh, work that he had done and really high level figures from the Israeli government and others were there. So we know that Maxwell had that position. And uh, so she she's a really important figure on the world stage. I'd say there's a few um, high level people on the world stage right now. Uh, and she's certainly one of them, um, Assange, no question about it. And um, I also, 
you know, my feeling is that um, this Harvard professor who was grabbed, Charles Lieber, is another one. Very important story to watch. Yes. Nijat Madri. Can they really suicide her? I don't think they can pull that trigger twice. Yeah. I mean, it would be incredibly obvious and stupid. Um, I hope that they don't. <laughs> I think that there's a lot um, for us to discover in relation to all this. Yes. Karen Carpenter, are the same interests behind CERN, Hot Zone, and Antarctica? Um, it's a coalescence <laughs> of groups that have a common interest, I would say, um, for sure. And uh, I also feel that, um, you know, CERN brings us into the people who are studying the transhumanist interdimensional aspect. But in each case uh, that you're mentioning there, it seems to be that there's a kind of summoning that they're trying to accomplish in the hot zone. Um, you know, I mean, there's an incredible treasure trove of humanity's past there, but I believe in addition to that, that they're looking for this connection, this aramonic connection with this Belial cult. I think that they feel that they're the heirs to that and that the, you know, the stars have moved back into alignment and they're there to take their, you know, we were the elites and now we're taking our role back and the technology is helping us do it. In fact, um, there's a kind of insanity running rampant among the elites right now, in case you haven't noticed, and they just will not let it go. Um, so I think some of the public reality is hitting them in the face, like the incredible low uh, popularity of their political figures and they're trying to change their game really fast before the whole thing turns over on them. Um, so I guess to answer your question, um, fundamentally there is a common thread, but it's a coalescence of group. It's certainly not a monolith group running those things. Well, ultimately, isn't it really that at the top, isn't the way to look at it is that there is sort of, there's a group of powerful people at the top who have investments, right? And you invest in corporations and whatnot, that these are teams who have are in control of different projects that they have running simultaneously, right? So they are, they're working in the hot zone, they're working in, in Antarctica, they're working at CERN. They, and those people don't even, who are there, don't even know that they are um, teams of the same group. Right. right. They're they're unaware. Um, I, I have a question for you, mm -hmm. actually. Um, do you think that if somebody, say, at a base sees an alien, <laughs> like an alien body, do you think that it becomes part of the experience of all of humanity because we subconsciously yes, tie in? Yeah. This is an important piece, I think. I've thought about this a lot, which is no matter how much secrecy that exists, no matter how much... They think that they've, you know, kept the secret of Atlantis or they've kept the secret of the hot zone or UFOs, you know, or their assassinations, whatever it happens to be, that we have the ability to tune in and see past it, uh, which I think is a crucial realization for us all, that there's something about, there's no way to actually keep a secret, you know, on that level. The secrecy, the wall of secrecy that they've erected is actually a false barricade because the ultimate realization that they're coming to is that all this stuff is connected. And so we're all interconnected uh, that way. So the secrecy, the wall of secrecy is, is an, sort of an idiotic exercise ultimately because ultimately we know, even if it's subconscious latent and not manifested. Uh, Marsha Ezel says morphogenetic field. Yes, right? exactly. And that's what they've been trying to destroy. Uh, and that goes to the work of Rupert Sheldrake. Mm -hmm. And I think he really nailed it on that. Um, is there anything else to show you? Let's see. Um, well, Terramar. I've got something to present. Yeah, what do you got? <laughs> okay, we missed this. So um, Rehoboth Farm said, did you know that Meatloaf was in Dallas the day of the Kennedy assassination and his car was commandeered by members of the Secret Service? It's true. 
And um, Brown Man says, Meatloaf was at Parkland Hospital when JFK was assassinated. He saw the blood splattered Lomo. Oh, my goodness. So I guess he presented this on a show. Wow. Incredible. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Well, he was a magnificent talent. I don't, the years there are kind of strange, though. Was he like a 10-year-old kid? Because he he made it at 22, and it was well, like 1974 uh, or something. No, no, so. no. He was in, he was in Hair. I know that. Right. But, you know, and so he was a teenager. Well, he was 74. Sort. Okay. All right. All right. Do so, math. so if you do, you know, <laughs> 22 years, he's born in 48. So he's a 15 year old kid. Okay. Uh, that's odd. I'll try to check that story out, but that's fascinating. Whew. You know, uh, uh, it was on Huckabee. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Oh, oh, we've lost some incredible. We have homework to do. Mm. Well, we've lost so many incredible talents. And the problem is, um, you know, the way that the organizations are run on the entertainment front, we're not replacing them with anybody good. <laughs> so, um, you know, we're really sort of running out of talent here. And I think there needs to be an okay. entire like culture wide movement in relation to entertainment and uh, music and everything else. There's a huge rediscovery to happen there. I remember reading this story about Oliver Stone um, and he was saying, you know, I can't make movies anymore because I go on set and they have these COVID people, you know, doing all this stuff. And then over here they have sensitivity counselors. You know, I, I can't have dialogue unless the sensitivity counselor is saying, well, you might not, you know, you might offend this group or offend that group. You can't make a movie that way. So all of the creativity of humanity is just, you know, held back by the wokeness of the BS in those uh, esteemed entertainment divisions and all the money behind it. So you're going to need a complete rehaul, a complete overhaul. This is of all economic. It's yes. All economic. I, I, I remember listening to an audiobook about Athens, Georgia, I think it was. And the, um, the kind of renaissance that they had there yeah. with the B-52s and whatnot. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. Um, REM. But, well, yeah, yeah, one of the reasons that happened was because it was cheap. It was a college town, but it was incredibly yes. cheap to live there. So this is, it's the same thing as It gave the them the ability. If you and your friends could rent a, a cheap Victorian and all live there and have time without working, you know, 40 hours a week to pay your rent, to play guitars, learn your instruments, write poetry, you know, creativity needs time. And I don't know, also with the smartphones, I'm not sure if, if people are going to be able to do that because there's it, they just pull your attention away. Well, it's interesting. It's a, It would be a kind of creative discipline for sure. It's pretty wild. You know, when I think about it, I still have this feeling fundamentally, and I'm going to keep exploring it, that the thing that the... Um, you know, the, the drivers, the elites in the world currently, the people who are downgrading civilization, that they they really, one of the things they're trying to package and lock away are the 60s. And this is interesting because, you know, I look back on the 60s and the, the generations there, they, they had a different sense and, you know, right or wrong, whatever it is, but they had a sense of creativity, spontaneity. It was a very human uh, exercise and creativity. And I think that they, um, from, you know, gobbling up Bob Dylan's work and, you know, putting him in, in jeopardy at this age with court cases and things like that, I have a feeling, and I've explored this a little bit and we will more, that it's the 60s is one of the things that they want to bottle up because the human expression factor is something the transhumanist can't have. They can't have the competition side by side whether that's filmmaking or entertainment or political figures, they need that thing. And I'll just encapsulate it as the 60s. Certainly is a really good expression there in the 60s of this as it was happening. The revolutions were all about freedom, right? The idea was about freedom. Kennedy was about freedom. Martin Luther King was about the civil rights movement and freedom. The music was about freedom, getting together. So... Uh, there's something dramatic there, I think, that was sullied in the in the 60s, and that they're still they still haven't figured out how to splice that gene out of humanity yet. Uh, and of course, it's alive and well. No, here. I think they have figured it. What you're talking about is unpredictability. 
Right? Ah, this yes. is the internet Spot of things. Names. Yes. This is this is why they want once it, this is what AI is studying and what it wants to control. So the predictive everything is um, tracked and traced and they it can predict everything in the future. Absolutely. Every behavior. And if they can control us and they can um I'm losing it. No, no, they, I'm with you. Just, I'm you actually, get, I agree with you 100%. I'd, I'll, I'd like to explore this one more. I think that they think what you're saying, what I get from what you're saying is that they think that by controlling thought, that they can get past anything that would be unexpected for them. You know, this is interesting too, because in relation to revolutions and things like that, they never want the French Revolution to ever happen again. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I was saying earlier. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that's what we're talking about. They do not want to be, you know, they, they wanna know every piece of everything that's gonna happen. That's what the data mining is all about. That's what the creation of AI is all about. However, take a look around the ideas room this kind of conversation, this is what they're not able to control. And this is the definitely the thing they want to get rid of. <laughs> so the fact that we're here and able to do it means there's hope for that spark. And that's what we're going to be able to do. And uh, that's some of what we did tonight. Fantastic. Miss Olivia? I have a bunch of super chatters to thank. Fantastic. Okay. So Michael, a cult fan, Little Green Men, Donald Smead, VJ, Eurythmy is fun, Deborah Sloan, Gigi Abby Lynn, Jim Sarge 3ID, Brian Kinney, Mark Petri, Thomas Tyson, Danaline Herbert, Luke Walker, Erica Swenson Elliott, Mark T, uh, Tricky Vicky, Ruth A, Chris Achella, Buis Lale, and Vivi. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we really appreciate your support here on the program. And uh, to all our supporters and subscribers, thank you. It helps us to deliver this kind of excellent, um, it gives us the time to be able to deliver this kind of reporting to you. We'll be back next week on Friday, and we have some surprises um, there. I'm working on an ex State of the Union. <laughs> I know that I know that Stepford Biden is not going to be able to hack a State of the Union after that press conference, so I'll, I'll do it for him. Um, and we will see, I'll do a couple of shout outs here uh, before we <laughs> go as well. A cult fan. It's great to see you out there. Daniel Foster. Oh, right. I have the magic now. I forgot. There we go. Bingo. Excellent. Groovy Bean. Hey, it's great to see you out there. Najat, fantastic. Great questions tonight, too. I think we're all on the same <laughs> page about the hot zone tonight. You could feel it. We were resonating on that. Astro Sam, thank you for being here. Easy Gamer. Groovy. <laughs> hey, look, it's Olivia Wings Girl. Mark H. Ruth A. Fuber Fighter. Hey. Melanie K. I love seeing the familiar faces out there. It's great. What a huge crowd for tonight. Brandy Renee, thank you. It's all about the hot zone. Exactly. Tell it like it is. Um, Ray Story, we'll see you next week. We'll be there. Deborah Sloan. Whew. I know Kate's out there. Would you like That's... to give out the address? If anybody wants to subscribe, I'd check. Yes. Um, some people have said that they didn't want to use PayPal. If you want to use PayPal, it's on, on the site. But if not, um, you can send it to Dark Journalist, 1770 Massachusetts Avenue, number 238, Cambridge, Massachusetts, lovely Harvard Square, 02140. And um, thank you for all your support. We will be back with you next week. I'll do a couple more. Alex Baldwin. I almost, <laughs> I think I was thinking Alex Baldwin, but the name can't be Alex Baldwin. <laughs> Golden Girl, Gigi Abby Lynn, Groovy Bean. I know Gigi Young was in the chat tonight also. Great to have Gigi out there. Uh, and let me tell you, <laughs> what Gigi has about the hot zone that I've explored with her, watch out when we bring that information out, because Gigi is really on the beam. Chrissy, it's great to see you, Chrissy. Brandy Renee. Catherine Harris, the University of X. I like it. Mm. <laughs> X like steganography. Actually, you know, we, everybody's been suggesting swag. I, that would be really good. Yes, I'm in Harvard. Exactly. <laughs> uh, 
but you know, it's nice around here. I have no, I have no complaints. <laughs> Carl Young. I've lived here my whole life, pretty much. C60 purple power. Wow. GG in the hot zone. Exactly. Michael Uhler. Great show tonight, DJ. Thank you. I appreciate that. Catherine Harris. No extra charge. You send me a free T-shirt. <laughs> yes, of course. We'll send you a free T-shirt. We just don't have any T-shirts, but eventually. <laughs> we'll... I have cufflinks. I'll send you a cufflink. Uh, Olivia, great show. Wow, great show. Exactly. Nice round of applause from Olivia Wings Girl. Nicely done. Congratulations. I've got low blood sugar. <laughs> That's okay. I'm sure there's some chocolate somewhere. Yes, <laughs> you read my mind. <laughs> a cult fan. I've got a blue chicken t-shirt. That's right. I forgot about oh, that I thing. Oh, I do too. I got that one. thing is legendary. Yeah, Whoa. it's a collector's item. We should have like a blue chicken day. <laughs> no question about it. I had another experience where LinkedIn was like, "Do you know this man?" Oh. This is Corey Good. Like, Ugh. I was like, "It's going to be one of those days, isn't it?" You can just tell. LinkedIn is trying to get me to like Corey Good. Yes, we love Gigi Young. Fantastic. Esoteric Gold. Wonder Twins activate form of a pillow to sleep on. These are great ideas. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Until next time, all keep well. Carol and Rose. Nicely done. We will see you all uh, next Friday and have a fantastic weekend. Uh, there's a fantastic event going on in Washington, D.C. about End the Mandates and RFK Jr., is out there. And I can tell you, this is every bit as important as any march that has taken place there in Washington, D.C. So um, to uh, Bobby, I hope he has a fantastic uh, event. And um, telling, yeah, they need our prayers. No question about it. And uh, I'm telling everyone I know to get down there if they can. And if not, support them. And uh, Children's Health Defense, of course, support those guys online. Uh, Bobby Kennedy doing uh, a remarkable job and he needs all our support on the front lines there. And um, I guess that about does it. Josh Randall. Great to see <laughs> you, sir. We will see you all next week. Carolyn Goida. I know you're out there. Just curious. How much did you not get to tonight? Oh, there's plenty for part two. <laughs> Put it that way. Well, the thing is the, uh, the hot zone. I mean, there's so many angles with Maxwell and, the, you know, the reporting changes daily on that whole situation. So literally, you don't know <laughs> what you're going to step into in relation to the Maxwell case, because literally in 24 hours, that whole thing, you know, something new could come out. So I, I think it's a powerful place to open up the hot zone conversation is right in the heart of that. Uh, we have about, you know, 20 different angles coming into it. But that one is particularly important, I think, as we learn more about it. Shazam! I like that. That was a great show, too. <laughs> El Kider, Esoteric Gold, Karen Carpenter. Wow, fantastic people here tonight. We will see you all next week. And thank you so much for joining us. And, you know, it says end broadcast, but, you know, the X broadcast never really ends. Am I right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no. Am I right? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Rat have great, speed. Have a great weekend. <laughs> <Rat speed. laughs> Roosevelt. Hey, it's great to see you, sir. Have a great night.